We present O'Rourke's First Case by Vincent McInerney with Ken Cumberledge as John O'Rourke. John? John? Hello, Dad. What happened? The job. Same as usually happens. I didn't get it. Who did? Ah, some young fella. More pens in his top pocket than the mad professor and a file of facts under his arm. I thought you were in with the chance this time, getting an interview. So did I. Till I got there. Then I became a 40-year-old redundant fitter from a bedding factory that was obsolete the day it was built. What are you reading? One of those detective yarns of yours. The truth was, apart from the fact that I'm white, I was your token black. At least you got a full working life at sea. Young Kelly and I have been waiting up the pub. Fancy one. <laughs> Curly. Now there's another one. 22 and never sniffed a job yet. Never sniff a pint if we don't get up there before three. 20 years I worked in that dump. Took the money. Now I'm supposed to sit here being consoled by Benny Hill. Well, I won't do it. What will you do? This. Build a publishing empire. Oh, become a private eye. Holmes. I should have guessed. But you didn't. Curly. I mean, he's been obsessed with that detective stuff since he was a lad. But I never thought he'd start to confuse fact with fiction. I don't know what his mother would have said. Same as mine when I told her I wanted to turn boxing pro. That to be considering it, a shoulder was already brain damaged beyond hope. Still, he's put his redundancy money where his mouth is. But I thought he'd apply for this uh, National Enterprise Allowance, like. And they gave you the cash anyway. The deal, roughly, is you go to them with a business scheme. If they like it, they'll give you 40 quid a week for a year to help you get it off the ground. Except? Yeah, <laughs> except to qualify for the money after being drawing benefit for at least eight weeks yeah. and have a thousand pounds in hand. Yeah, just like that. Of course, they'll take a bank loan or overdraft facility. Hey, who wouldn't? It seems a bit strange, though. Money to be a private eye. Yeah, I know what you mean. There are things that are no go. Blowing up nuclear installations... Opening up sex shops, but producing homemade chocolate, working a vegetable garden, wanting to be a private eye. John reckons they were pretty helpful by and large. Just went to the job centre to find out if he qualified and got himself invited to an awareness day. Oh, yeah, that sounds different. Videos, financial advice, lunch. Then the other half of the videos, more advice, application forms, and today, the final interview where he takes along proof of the availability of his thousand pounds. Uh, not so different after all. Just another feast in the new church of Thatcher. How about you? Anything going? Yeah, can't get a girl, never mind a job. They don't really want to know you when you're out. At least not the sort I like. Hey, you know how Chris is back with me and me mum? She finally left that smooth-talking bastard she was married to. Wonder what John's reaction will be to that. <clears throat> Quiet, isn't it? Not much to shout about in the job centre. Not this side of the counter, anyway. Quite. <laughs> Looking for employment yourself. Charlie Rose, by the way. Oh, John O'Rourke, I'm on this Enterprise Allowance Wagon. Today's yes or no time. Mm. I'm after some gen on that sort of thing myself. Right. I'm a merchant seaman, but, well, uh, I've had enough one way or another. Well, you'll have to be an out-of-work merchant seaman to do any good here. Yeah. Uh, just on leave, actually. Exploring possibilities. No go. Out eight weeks and drawing benefit. They could try them, though. There's always a couple beat the net, no matter how small the mesh. <laughs> what is it you've got in mind? Oh, dogs. English setters. Oh, yeah. Gentlest things in the world. Take a bone from their mouths. All the virtues of man and none of the vices. <laughs> How's it go? <laughs> oh, something like that. You want to breed them? That sort of thing? Hmm. Like to set up a kennels. Oh, I don't think you'll do it from here. Not without a dole card. That's the enterprise allowance idea, you see. Help those who are on the floor but have got access to a bit of money. And those without access to a bit of money? Well, they have to help themselves. It's known as the pauper's penalty. Mr O'Rourke? Mr O'Rourke? It's the container ships, you see. Work and more work. And that bloody Western Ocean. I was used to other things. India. East Africa. The warmth. Colour. Mr O'Rourke? Oh, look, I've got to go. Got to get this interview over yeah, with. Of course. Well, best of luck. Oh, I forgot to ask what you're trying for. Oh, private detective. Like yourself, I'm also after a bit of life. My helping of excitement, warmth and colour. <laughs> so then they gave it you? Oh, with due warnings, provisos and just a hint of blackmail. Hey, nothing for nothing in this world, John. <laughs> hey, haven't said that. Here's a wine gun for nothing. Oh, it's getting a bit nippy these mornings. 
How far now? I'm just down here. <whistles> More fields. Prestige address. <laughs> Used to be. Liverpool will come back, don't worry about that. Hey, what do your dad say about leaving home? Getting a flat in town? Well, he went quiet for a bit. Then asked where it was. Who'd had it before me? Told him I thought a painter. I'd left all sorts of weird pictures lying around. Bit of a nutter, maybe. What do your dad say to that? That some places attracted him. Then told me to take you in with me. Said he felt I was going to need an ex-scrapper. Anyway, here we are, so you can see for yourself. Up there! Those stairs! That penthouse suite! Follow me. So I asked them to start paying in the 40 a week in a fortnight's time. First of October. Stop. This is it. John, we're higher than the post office tower. How are you going to attract anyone up here? The Enterprise people went into that. Local paper, local radio, yellow pages. It all comes in the package. Why won't this lock open? Did the other day. Probably seized with cold at this altitude. Anyway, shouldn't you be able to crack one of those now without leaving any trace? Curly, be a good lad. Step down to Dale Street and get me a junior hacksaw, will you? Right. That's it. Now then. Well, what do you think? Never seen anything like this, John. I know. Black as a bucky's fingernails. I, I was thinking more of it. Oh, then. Well, you must have seen those painter fellas on the telly and that, surely. That's it with everyone. Cutting their ears off. If that one leaning on the far walls anything to go by, it's up their ears need cutting off. <laughs> See, the priest came round. Say, my dad did. And that one. Size 40 boob in red. <laughs> Green eye in the middle of it. Halo over the top. It's uh, no name or nothing. Have a look on the back. Oh, so there is. Celestial Vision by Adrian Mintz. That's it then. Celestial Vision by Adrian Mintz. What do you think? Let's have the mop. They're ended by hanging around the walls. You should see them. I don't have to. Where's he kipping? He sectioned a bit off. Knocked up a partition with a velvet curtain instead of a door. Sounds a bit Oscar Wilde to me. Nah, you wouldn't know what to think. You mightn't. Any custom? Not a sausage. Just three weeks scrubbing and hammering. What's he doing with himself all day? Nah, he walks around town. Has he been in touch with you? Rang me to let me know the phone was in. A couple of times since. And how about you? At least they've got this place and the betting shop. Well, John's got an empty office. So neither of you are getting anywhere. He's not going to ask for help. We'll give him some, anyway. Oh, hello, Chris. Oh. What are you doing here? Oh. Hello, John. Your dad gave me a key. Oh, right. Oh, Curly's been coming home with more dust on him than a Jubilee teapot. <laughs> bit early for you to be out and about, isn't it? Well, I just nipped out for a walk in a paper, you know, same as every morning. Nothing more sinister than that. Anyway, as you weren't here, I just let myself in. You need to get some decent carpets. Keep the dust down. I've been trying to sort the bedroom first. Sink, geezer, a few bits of furniture, a mattress. Your dad thought your old firm might give you one. How is he? Seems to spend a lot of time in the pub. We sit and watch the domino players together. What happened, Chris? I mean, what went wrong? Oh, with me and my ex. Oh, the usual. Started working overtime, went on to late, then graduated to permanent nights. I had no kids to consider, just the occasional black eye, so I packed me Valium and left. What really happened, of course, was virtue led me astray. Being a good Catholic girl, you see, I made him wait, so he married me for the first night, then went back to being a bachelor. I had nothing to go back to. I'd already given it all to him. Well, at least, as you said, there were no kids. Not for want of trying. 
I actually thought they might give him a sense of responsibility. The politics of despair. By that time, he'd got bored, so I had to go for all the tricks. Chris, uh, I... A bit embarrassed, are you, John? You should be where I've been. But still no go. The kids, that is. Oh, I couldn't. He couldn't. Who knows? What about the tests? Oh, yes, the tests. Excuse me, Bill, for interrupting while you're at the difficult task of poring over the racing page. He was named Bill, by the way, after what came through the letterbox each morning. <laughs> Excuse me, dear. Would you like to take your feet off the table? Offer me the remains of your takeaway. Let me open you another can of lager. Then perhaps accompany me down to the clinic to take some tests. Oh, John. What if it were him? I mean, a real man being presented with a certificate saying he had no balls. It would have been designer stubble and Sunday football all the way. And he was sweaty enough as it was. I didn't realise. You're married, you just moved out, went away. I, I went I... for a tour, John. A tour of human nature. You really think I'm sorry there were no kids? After what I saw en route... John, isn't it? John O'Rourke. Yes, hello there. Oh, Bob from the job centre. Right. Hang on, uh, Jimmy, no, uh, Billy, uh, um, something about horses, wasn't it? No, <laughs> sheep, sheep. You're a card, <laughs> Mr Spade. Charlie, Charlie Rose. Of course. Merchant seaman. Wanted to open a kennels, right? Um, setters, dogs you can take a bone out of their mouths. Why? All the virtues of a man, etc. Right? <laughs> <laughs> you have any joy? I mean, do they take you? I'm afraid it turned out just as you said. Benefit claimants only. I'm uh, on leave again and saw your advert in the paper. Thought I'd look you up. <laughs> Had a bit of trouble finding this place, though, I must admit. You're not alone there, Charlie. Oh, this is Chris, part of the team. The blonde, good-looking part. Chris, pleased to meet you. Look, John, thing is, I found a little place over on the Wirral. Really? Near where I live, that's West Hartwood. Small market town. This house is up for sale and has got a bit of land attached. Good possible kennel space. Hmm. But there's a problem, is there? I mean, something that needs a professional touch. I just can't seem to get in to see it. I thought you said it was for sale. Yeah, a bit complicated. The owner went abroad for a time and let it. Then the owner decided he wasn't coming back and wired the estate agents to sell the place. Except they can't get the bloke out who's rented it. <laughs> Trouble is, they can't really seem to catch him in. Seems to me to be one of those shadowy calls you hear about. Sort of scarlet pimpernel. Huh? Would you care to tackle it, John? Well, I... I, I thought after seeing your advert in the paper, it might be the sort of thing that... Well, you could maybe do it while I'm away if you're too busy now. Are we, John? I can't remember. I sail for the States at midnight tomorrow from the Seaforth Container Terminal, so it's a bit awkward for me. Well, it's really nice of you to think of me, Charlie, but, well, you see here, we're more into the, the kind of... the Lord Lucan. <laughs> Brinks Matt. Shergar. Oh, hello, is that the phone, John? With that call you're expecting from Interpol about the Van Goghs. <laughs> That's Chris's little joke, Charlie. She once lived next door, sort of gives her a privileged position. Uh, that and never having forgiven me for once seeing her in her liberty bodies, having Vic rubbed on her uh, chest. <laughs> yes, oh, of oh. course. <laughs> ah, it's a strange old world. Just thought I'd drop in. Let me leave you the address of this place, yeah. though, just, just in case you do get a moment. Here you are. And, as I say, West Hartford. Listen, if I'm over there, Charlie, I'll see what I can do. That's a promise. Best of luck, then. Yeah. Bye, Chris. Ta-ra. <laughs> it's a nice book. Wants to breed setters. He wants some help with his house, too. Oh, come on, Chris. That's hardly my sort of thing. What is? My sordid memoirs. He was looking for a service you're supposed to provide. That you're obliged to provide. You got the enterprise money to be John O'Rourke, private eye, not Hercule Poirot, confidant of kings. Hello. Put me foot in it, have I? Like me to come back later? That is, if I can manage them bloody stairs again without a guy. <sighs> no need. I'm just off. Next time, Mr O'Rourke, I'll bring some carbolic soap and we'll have a real clean out. Uh, uh, let, let me help you on with your coat. You're a real gentleman, that's what you are. He's a real gentleman. Of the old school. You know the type. And who was that? Uh, when you sit down, Miss, Mrs... Um, Mrs. Uh, Miss. Right. Anyway, whoever she is, I can see she's got her own troubles. Oh, I bet I'll know what's caused them. Bloody men. Here. Get many pervs hanging round this place. Do you want me to find you one? Bottom of your stairs. Queer-looking cove. 
glary eyes reading a magazine with a bloody big sort of wolfhound on the front. Bestiality, perhaps? <laughs> They're all at it. You too, I suppose. How can I help you, Mrs. Wright? This photo. Ten years ago from the clothes. Dark curly hair. Five, five, six. Natty dresser. Likes women. Yeah. How do you know his height? It's that card he's against. It's a Porsche, isn't it? They're pretty low slung. He won't be as tall as he seems. Him and his bloody Porsches. Wonder he doesn't change his name to Porsche. Wouldn't be the first time. And that handbag on the edge of the print. Now that shows he likes women. Shows he likes something carries handbags. <laughs> as it happens, you're right. Because that's me. Just out of the picture, as usual. I want you to find that bastard. Would that be uh, Mr. Rate? As was. Ronnie Rate. I don't know or what he is now, except he's living across the Mersey, on the Wirral Peninsula somewhere. But if you know roughly where he is... The no... Wirral's a big place, Sonny. Well, big place full of little places. But it's also full of smart money. So, that's where Ronnie will be. He left London for what he called business in Liverpool, but the Wirral's where he'll be staying. Here. In this envelope, a retainer and exes. And what? Expenses. And 500 cash when you find him. Right. Well, now, if I could just take some details. Details? Where you live, that sort of thing. <laughs> Don't make me laugh. Here's a telephone number. A confidential telephone number. Right. I'll be off. Mmm. Collect modern, do you? Modern art. Oh, on the wall. <laughs> yes. Right. Best investment of all, if you know what you're doing. Ron is into it, of course. Specialises in nudes, you won't be surprised to hear. How do you pick them, then? The ones that are going to move. Oh, oh, That one there, for instance. Big green tip with a red eye in the middle and a rubber band over it. Got something there. Yes, people think so. I believe the artist saw it as a, an ultimate set of symbols to depict the idea of the great Earth Mother. Oh, blimey. <laughs> No wonder they're all hanging round your stairs. Right, get busy. Oh, Mrs. Wright, before you go, why me? Sentiment, really. Remember that old movie, A Rock of the Mounties? I saw it as a girl three times. Broke my heart. So, I picked your name from the local paper. You got lucky, Mr. O'Rourke. Let's see if you can get successful, eh? You don't realise how heavy books are till you come to move them, do you? Spiders will have to get themselves on the housing list now your library's going. Oh, whoops, there's one falling out. Oh, let's see. The Case of the Vanishing Egyptian Cigarettes by Mustafa Fag. Oh, Dad! <laughs> <laughs> Let me open the front door. <laughs> I left him in the car. Oh. Once we get him in the boot, I'll run you to the top of the street for a pint. Um. Look, I needed a car. Curly got it from his mate. It's a bargain. 150 quid. It's three months tax and a year's MOT. How about an anthrax clearance from the Port Health? Right. That's them safe. Safer than we're liable to be. Come on, Dad. Learn to live dangerously. Climb in. I'll put her through her pieces for you. this morning. Oh, I must have just flooded. As Noah said. Any luck with Mr. Mystery yet? I've tried every sizable place on the Whittle. Must be using a false name. You don't say. Let's have a look at that photo again while we wait for liftoff. Right. Here. 70s snap. Long hair. Mexicano mustachios. Lapels like Coco the Clowns. Trouser bottoms like barnacle bills. Well, what's that he's draped over? His Porsche. Likes him, does he? Children he never had. Hmm. Why she wants him, you think? This Mrs. Rate. Maintenance, I suppose. And why you? Why not a big agency? Why all the money? I told you that. O'Rourke of the Mounties. 
sentiment. The Mrs. Rates of this world are about as sentimental as a bosun's fist. You've got something, haven't you? All right, Dad. Let's have it. You've picked a queer business. I won't have one if I can't come up with Monty Macho there. I don't suppose there can be many with a name like that. Even on the Whirl. A name like what? Well, come on. Mr. Porsche, noted car lover. Oh, come on, Louise. It works! From time to time. Well, that's little bees done out. What's next, Curly? West Hartwood. Right, where are we? Yeah, West Hartwood. Oh, well, seventh time lucky, I suppose. Hang on! I told you it had all happened at once, Curl. Told me what had happened. Come in! Afternoon, sir. Not too bad for early November, is it? John O'Rourke, private investigator. Detective Inspector Crossed, public nuisance. Take you long, did they? The paintings. Oh, left behind when we took the lease. Didn't think anyone would object if I stuck them up. Not technically theft, I suppose. That one there. Let's have it down. Celestial Vision, Adrian Mintz, 1983. Acrylics and oil in cheap snap-in frame. Not that I know anything about it. Just that the info you want is on the back. You're right, son. Blow me cover. That a kettle, Mr O'Rourke? Kelly, would you... Uh... No, I'm not your ordinary copper. Six packets of gum a day, 80 smokes, double beef, curry and chips washed down by a bottle of scotch. Why, I've even got open university credits. Sugar, and are you sweet enough? But they're not what I've really wanted. What I've really wanted is people to like me as a person. Well, most coppers do. Of course, no one ever does. And that, in the end, is what breeds iron in the soul and reduces us to page three in the sun and four aways on the fixed odds. John, was this milk sour when you bought us? Years ago, we'd throw the streets of Liverpool to in the morning when the clubs let out. Why am I being arrested, they'd shout, as if two in the morning wasn't enough in itself. Once we got them to the bridewell, the other lads would say, bend your truncheon round the bastard's head, Sarge. That'll quieten him. Or kick him in the ghoulie, Sarge. Give him something to shout about. Thanks, son. Kelly, is it? But I never did. So, none of the other bobbies liked me either. In the end, though, they came round. You know why? Because I got promoted. And everybody likes the boss. At least, if they've got any sense, they do. They listen to his questions carefully and answer them honestly. And my question to you, Mr O'Rourke, is why you aren't with us and... We're in size 11s instead of in this dump causing unease. Because I want to be a boss too, like yourself. No, Mr O'Rourke, not like me. Not like me at all. For a start, I assume it's me and my kind paying your wages here that you've hit on this as your final hope. I've hit on this as my only hope. And young Sherlock? He's coming in with me on a youth scheme. Ah, Dombey and Son. You know, when I came here, I came to... Uh, stamp on you. But I'm so impressed by you both, I'm going to offer you a deal. You give me anything that's ours by right, serious crimes, as it were, and I'll give you all the lost kittens and milkmen caught with their trousers down. OK? And what about clients' confidentiality? What about... <laughs> clients' confidentiality? What about it? Got something in the confidential line, have we? Just a hypothetical question. There ain't no such animal, Mr O'Rourke. There ain't no hypothetical questions. There ain't no hypothetical cases. There's open cases, shut cases, and there's Shirsi La Femme cases. Follow me? Nice cup of tea, that. Nelly? He knows about Mrs Reet. Does he? Of course he does. 
That's a bigger nap than pins. I mean, can I trust him? You know what happened when St. Patrick drove the snakes out of Ireland, don't you? They all swam to Liverpool and joined the police force. <laughs> so what would you do? Time now, lads! Dad, what are you saying? If I'd signed on the ship, I'd do the work. That's what I'm saying. Think about it, John. Which town, please? Uh, West Hartwood, on the Weddell. And the name, please? Uh, Mr Porsche. He'll be a new subscriber. It's spelt the same as the car. Hold a moment, please. Oh. I'm sorry, caller. That number is... No, I said he'd be a new subscriber. Sorry, caller. But that number is ex-directory. Great. Yeah? Hello, is Mrs Rake there, please? Who is it? Mrs Rake, please. You didn't hear me, China. I asked who it was. John O'Rourke. That's better. Liz, there's a geezer called O'Rourke wants a word. Voice on him like he's trying to sell timeshare at the North Pole. Oh, it's that tech I was telling you about. How are things among the golf widows and wife swappers, Sunshine? Using plenty of Polaroid? Yeah, give me that, Bogger. Oh, come on. Keep your hands off come me. On. Sounds as if he wants a hedgehog down his jockstrap to me, Liz. Just get two drinks, eh? That's Bogger. All wet eyes, instinct and aggro. Right, what have you got? Mr Rate, now Porsche, is living in West Hartwood, the Wirral. Good boy. What's the bastard's address? Ah, well, uh, that's the next thing. Uh, just bringing you up to date at the moment, letting you catch the drift, like. I don't want bringing you up to date, Mr O'Rourke. You weren't hired as a calendar. Hard info or I'll be round for my money back. Except it'll be Bogger that collects it. Understand me? Well, Curly, the main feature's finally on the way. X certificate stuff, do you think? Oh, PG at most, I'd say. PG? Does that mean pretty gory? Shazam! A car park in the heartland of West Hartwood. What now? Nearest upmarket bar. But what's to say he uses them? It's part of the image. He'd get withdrawal symptoms if he wasn't in a plush lounge at lunchtime with a large one in front of him. You come in. Nah, looks a bit pricey. I'd be out of place in an anorak and jeans. Hmm. I'll hang on here. Hey, it's not a maintenance job, all this, is it? Mrs Rake never said it was. What's it really about? I told you. Plush lounges, large ones and Porsches. And a chance for us to start at the top. Have one for me. Uh, pint of bitter, please. Oh, we're the twins, ting a ling a ling We're the twins, ting a ling a ling We're the brothers St John and we know when we're on... <coughs> Yes, sir. Pint of bitter, please. Oh, no pints here, love. Over the road in the British Legion, behind the stables. Just follow your nose. A scotch, then. Double scotch for the gent. Anything with it? Wouldn't mind a bit of ice. No, wouldn't mind a bit myself. And change from a fiver. Keep it. Mmm, yes. Now, what are you really after, love? This photo. Oh, that suit! Yeah, taken about ten years ago. And paying for it ever since. The hair and mustachios will have gone by now, too. Yeah, unless he's appearing as the bearded lady somewhere. Well? You got a pal looking for your love. Hmm? Someone's just popped in, then out. You know what I mean? Small, slim, blonde hair. Tempter. No, large, very large. Face like a full moon, hair like a Brillo pad. Trust. No ring through the nose, but I thought there was a bit of snout there all the same. One of them are you, love? No. How about the photo? Well, you know what we bar persons need, don't you? A good union and a decent wage. Oh, here. We talk about relief without satisfaction. Yeah, and another. I should hope so. Is in the other one. Other one? Other hotel, love. Places like this always have two. One for the landed and layabouts, one for the lawyers and arse slickers. And what's he? He's in the Queen's arms at the moment, ducks, and she's welcome to him. What's happened? Oh, it's over there. No sign of crust. But Rake was propped up in the lounge as large as life. Clocked me right away. 
Some sort of sixth sense. Known as self-preservation. And slips out as I'm buying a drink. So you lost him? Just what we didn't do. I got tired of hanging around in the car and went for a stroll. Caught a Rachel Porsche or whatever coming out the pub and followed him down a side street to one of those snazzy little antique shops. Yeah. Import and export. Sort of place that's never open unless it's shut. So he's in that lot as well? Yeah, though we're not under his own name. Not another. Mr A. Ferrari. Oh. <laughs> Put the kettle on, will you, John? I'll have a cup of antifreeze and a power steering pie. <laughs> <laughs> right. Something wrong? It's dirty. Greasy. I've never seen it like that before. Thought you'd be too busy to notice. Dad, look, I really think... So what now? Obvious. Our two intrepid heroes mount guard outside Rate's place until he finally shows up. Whenever Dad is. It won't be too long between visits. Rate's probably someone got his money the hard way. He's not going to leave any of it lying around without keeping a close eye on it. We'll go back there tomorrow. He'll show up, if only to check the doors. You going to let Mrs Rate know? I think so. I bloody well know so. Having the man from the Prue call is bad enough. The man from the zoo, Mrs Rate's bogger, would be another matter. <laughs> So let's have a cup of then you two can get an early start. After all, that's the only way to get the worm. Oh. <laughs> there he goes. He's just leaving the shop, heading for the Porsche. Mm. Hey, I hate to admit it, but you were right about him checking the joint every day. Is Mrs. Reid any happier this time when you rang? Said she knew about his love of antiques from pictures she'd seen of his old girlfriends. And where's the address? Coming up very shortly. He's moving off. Right, John, get going. Right. I can't get into first. Oh, one other thing she said I ought to know. Rate a psychopath. What? It's no good, Carl. I can't move it. Here, get out and let me try. Come on, we'll lose him. What if he spots us? What if he does? No psychopath's happy unless he thinks he's being followed. Come on, John, shift yourself. We've got to get going. Place like this, you'd wonder where all the traffic comes from. The thing is, it's there and it stops him spotting us. Shit, he's pulling in. We'll do the same. Look, there's a the space. Stick your head out the passenger window. Right. Don't believe it. He's talking to a copper and pointing back here. Oh, you're choking. What's worse, the copper happens to be Inspector Crust. Here he comes. Why the window back off? I'm trying to. Oh. Afternoon, sir. It's your vehicle. Bit off your beat, aren't you, Mr. Crust? In uniform, too. Simple disguise to fool the villains. I don't know, Mr. Old Hawk. Modern art collection, chauffeur-driven vintage car. Guided tours of your office shortly. The gent in the red sports job. Porsche, is it? He thinks you've lost your way, and I agree. Up to now, Mr. Old Hawk, I thought there were only two kinds of Liverpool drug dealers. Those with large houses in Surrey, and those with small cells in Walton. But maybe there's a third kind. You and I have to have a talk shortly, Mr. O'Hawk, about a lot of money that's gone missing. But for now, get Chitty Chitty Bang Bang started up and get off back through the tunnel before... I take that rusty back bumper and stick it up your jacksie and get that rear off driving... Hello? John O'Rourke. Mrs. Reach, I need to speak to you. You haven't got it, have you? The address. Why are you looking for your husband? I mean, what, what about all this money? There's a policeman named Crust turns up everywhere. Where does he come in, eh? Where does the man in the moon come in? You were hired to make inquiries on my behalf, not your own. I'm not happy about all this, Mrs. Reach. You'll be unhappier still if Bogger comes calling. Let me tell you something, Mr. O'Rourke. You're an amateur in everything. Between the worst professional and the best amateur is a bridge that can't be crossed. And you're on the wrong side of it. Yeah, well, I'm the first to admit that as far as pros go, you've probably got them all licked. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. No, you shouldn't. You can eat those words shortly, Mr O'Rourke. And each one will be like a mouthful of sawdust. Mrs Ray, if you... Bogger! Yeah, Liz? I want that Scouse Mick. Oh, sure, Joe, sure. 
How many pieces? As many as you like, and the smaller the better. Well, how will we set him up, Liz? From tomorrow, we tail him every time he goes across to the Wirral. That way, he'll set himself up. And Ronnie. He's got the address, then? He thinks he's close enough to try to start striking deals. Bogger, that bastard just insulted me. Oh, he don't know no better, Liz. No education. No sense of protocol. That's his trouble. You leave him to me. Him and Ronnie, right? Yeah. I know. Well, that is just get the money from Ronnie. Rough him up a bit, but... Sure. I, I understand. Nothing a doctor can't fix. That's scouts, though. Yeah, sure. Uh... Exactly. <laughs> come here. Oh, not oh, now, Bogger. Not yeah. here. Oh, oh Bogger, let go, oh, will you? Oh, talking about that stuff. The aggro business. Well, you know how it gets me going. Then at least the bedroom. No, doll, here. I'd give you what you want all the time, Liz. Now and again, you've got to come across with the same for me. So, you're going to come home every weekend now? There's no reason why both of us should have nothing to do for two days of the week. Besides, I miss you making the eggs and bacon Saturday mornings. You don't mind, do you? Well, I'm putting together quite a social life these days. Best time I've had in years. Oh. Fridays, tonight that is, we've started going to St. Joe's Parish Club. Me, Chris and Curly, few pints. Bit of a dance to Father Molyneux's latest discoveries in the group line. A bit dead, as I remember, on a Friday. Not as dead as we'll eventually be. Why not join us? Go and stick on a clean shirt. I don't know. What's on telly tonight? Chris isn't for a start. You might have got over your blue period, but she hasn't. She needs someone to talk to whether she knows it or not. And it might as well be you. Come on. It's all time off in purgatory. Aren't you going to ask me about the case? Why? What's happened? I've had a phone call from a seafaring gentleman. One leg and a line in maps with little crosses. <laughs> go on, son. Go on, change. You're going to have to join the human race again sometime. Cheers, Curly. Cheers, Curly. Cheers, As I was saying, his name's Charlie. Charlie Rose. Wanted to breed dogs and he's been looking at a place on the Whittle. You remember Chris. I do now. West Hartwood. That's right. He even gave the address. Except he couldn't get in to see it, because the lessee was never available. The lessee's name, of course, being Mr... Reed! Porsche. Ferrari. Oh, Ferrari, <laughs> yes. what? 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 Evening all. Anyone for a pint? Family group tonight. A particularly literate villain once told me how he thought the lads in the force were like one big happy family. The Borgias. <laughs> Sit down, Mr Crust. This is me dad oh. and Curly's sister, Chris. Nice to meet you, Mr O. Oh. And you, uh, Mrs... Uh... Oh, Miss. Somewhere in the middle at the moment. Ah. The Israeli, I think it was, said every woman should marry. And no man. That's politicians for you. <laughs> Your fella holds similar views, did he, Chris? My husband disliked politics, Inspector. Though he didn't feel the same about parties. <laughs> Great reader, are you? You deserve a course I'm doing to improve myself. <laughs> Give the barman a shout, will you, son? It's counter service. They like to see you's in. <sighs> Next to you, I think, Mr. Oh, O'Rourke. Oh, 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 <laughs> along, gents. Oh, yeah, well, don't fall off the end of the bench. Oh. Better than appearing in front of it, son, believe me. Oh. And oh. now, ladies and gentlemen, while you're all enjoying yourselves and each other's company, <laughs> and before we hear from the nags, oh. a word about this year's parish out into Lourdes. You oh. believe in miracles, oh. Mr. O'Rourke? and tombolas held on this spot every Saturday night to help the old and ill to places. Saturday being tomorrow, for those who aren't sure. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps oh, just oh, medical drugs, eh? Last drug I touched was some stuff uh, from the chemist from my dad's rheumatics. Who attended the shrine last year was after telling me a good tale. Lady in front of there, coming through customs, had a two-litre bottle of Lourdes water. Customs man opens it, takes a sniff. Gin, says he. Another miracle, cried she. <laughs> <laughs> what would you say to half a million, Mr O'Rourke? Made on the backs of the young, weak and downtrodden. So, without further ado, Father Molyneux's answer to the Beatles, ladies and gentlemen, the Nair! Oh. Are we talking about the seasonal adjustment to the unemployment figures? Don't annoy me, Mr O'Rourke. I'm in the wrong job for that. Well, we're on to start with, folks. Just another night, written by our drummer, the one and only Bobby Mack. Oh. Yeah, right, Bobby. 
So after that 21st party last week, I'm sure everyone already knows who you are. Come and take a Right, lads, let's go with it. From the top, just another night. Interesting looking group of lads. Winsomely sentimental. Now, what do you think, Mr. Rowe? Winsomely sentimental? Sounds like the name of two Harrison boats. <laughs> I'm going to cut you in, Mr. O'Rourke. We're going to share our thoughts. Feeling low. Spoke a joint of grass. Stiff a line of snow. Score a gram of age. Maybe do some speed. Hope they're old enough to use the bar. Speaking of which, Kelly, here's a used tenner. Take your time. People see me taking money off you, they might begin to wonder. Let's face it, you're not going to be mistaken for an altar boy, not in here. Explain, will you, Mr. O'Rourke? Before I have to, in a way he'll remember. You and whose army? Curly. Curl, this is important, right? It's the case. Just this once? Yeah, well... But it'll only be the ones. How lucky we are, eh? Use of stuff that don't endure. And you, Mr. O, taking a turn round the floor with Chris now, are you? Bit advance for me. Yeah. Trick is not to have your feet kicked from under you. Not in public, anyway. Oh, dear, oh, dear. I hope I'm not going to have to get official with you lot tonight. Especially when you're dealing with size 11s. Come on, Dad. I... He's right. Size 11s are size 11s in or out of uniform. Excuse me. Come on. The Chopin waltzes might be waltzes, but they're not waltzes any human being could ever dance to. She'd manage it, though, eh? Just look at her. Figure off a music box. Like seeing her again for the first time. Some of them seem to hunt out the good ones like her. The special ones. Just so they can spoil what's in them. Okay. Pin your lugs back. And I'll help make her proud of you. Many moons ago, there was a flourishing drugs racket round the south coast. Much tripping among the trippers and we couldn't nail it we couldn't nail it because it wasn't static the big cheese der grosser Kaiser, mr ronnie rate had come up with a new idea and like many new ideas it paid off well initially he got himself a mobile home a couple of mobile homes well mr caravan he gutted him and rigged him out his laboratories i had a few bent chemists and laughed all the way to the bank Five hundred thousand pounds, we reckon, at the end of the day. Which is what it's all about. Which is what part of it's about. Because at the end of that same day, of course, we caught on and moved in. And now we come to his better half. His Porsche. His wife, Mrs. Wright, did the time for him. Thinking she was coming out to half the cash and a faithful husband. Well, half the cash, anyway. So why didn't he do the time? Oh, usual reasons. Everything and everybody in her name. He's a tongue as smooth as a mole's coat. Plus the viciousness of a tiger with piles. You'll find out. Will I? You see, we want the money. She wants the money. He wants to keep the money. And all playing for real. And me? Piggy in the middle. And you? Oh, I represent the professionals. What are they doing? Waiting and watching. Same as all professionals do. You'll learn. You'd be surprised how much you could learn just sitting and listening. Late thinks we're about, you see. He'll freeze on the money. But if he imagines it's just yourself and Mrs. Wright. I'm at her evening again.
Mrs. Reed's got someone with her. Bugger Bone. Known as the clumsy carpenter, he's broken so many legs. London, East End. And bred not to let go once his teeth are in. He'll hurt you. He'll hurt you, son. <laughs> Ronnie will kill you. But Bugger will hurt you so much, he'll wish you were dead. If I have a go, find the cash, like. What's in it for me? Whatever's in your head. Only you know that. Plus my goodwill, which you need. <laughs> You're thinking of staying on in this game in this town, eh? Now it's clue time. Rate has two containers of antiques at the C4 terminal waiting to go to America. They're waiting because the papers on them keep getting lost. We've had a good look, but there ain't nothing we can see but woodworm, super glue and cheek. But that's where we think it's going to happen. Right, here's Rate's address. Ostentatious sort of a bungalow set in half an acre of privacy. I'm off to town for the Chinese. Give my regards to the folks. And tell the group, don't call me. I'll be putting them under surveillance as a matter of course. Now, this is what I call a real end to an evening at St Joe's. Yeah. You seem pretty much at home here, ordering and that. Oh, my ex was a great one for chats over the chapatis before it became punches over the porridge. Uh, your martini, man. Oh, oh like thanks. The food will be following immediately. Thanks very much. I say... Here it's all decor by MGM and prices courtesy of the Maharaja. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry to go on about it. It just catches up with me sometimes. But that bastard really put me through. And to be with someone you think understands. Oh, it's nice to feel trusted. Especially as I, I feel. the case. Uh, I'll visit Rate's place tomorrow. How will you approach it? Through art, as Crust might say. Oh, I've done nothing but gather info and I feel dead beat. It's the emotional drain. Like the divorce. Uh, uh, there I go again. You know, what we both need is a holiday. A crust was mentioned in mobile homes and it set me thinking. You know, I've never had a weekend in a caravan. Well, I have. Oh. John, I couldn't have another man like that yet. Not if he came on a gold platter with an apple in his mouth. You see this crew round the walls, looking like extras from the King of the Khyber Rifles? Very colourful. Do you ever wonder what they do to their wives when they get home? Oh, Chris. I... Well, I do. All the time. Quarter of an hour, then. Come and get me. OK, Curly? I should be in there with you. You are cross. This fella's dangerous. He wouldn't wear two of us. See ya. Uh, Mr. Reid, my name's John O'Rourke. I got your address from the Electoral Register. Uh, there's a painting in your shop window I'd like for my wife's birthday. It falls pretty soon, which is why I've gone to these sorts of lengths, checking your name and that. Stand back slightly, would you? That's better. World War II Luger. Picked it up in a jackboot sale. Come in, Mr. O'Rourke. Come in and tell me all about it. You're an absolute bloody marvel, Bogger. You really are. O'Rourke in a biscuit barrel on wheels and you lose I'll it. I'll do me a favour, Liz. In that, that, that nutcase, staggering all over the road with those... Three bloody dogs leaping up at his throat. <laughs> Jumping around like vicars in a Soho sex shop. I miss the smoke too. Reckon we'll ever see it again. Stop. <laughs> What's up, please? That driveway we just passed. Her walk's car sitting at the bottom of it. Well, 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 what do you know? Now, remember what I told you. Not too much on Ronnie. Just where he's planted the dosh. And O'Rourke. Well, I'll have to let him get clear for now. Sets my teeth on edge, but there you are. Now, don't worry, Bog. You, you get your chance to ring his bell for him. <laughs> so, just pull over into those bushes when you're ready, and uh, we'll wait for Liverpool Larry and his mate to leave. Anything else? Oh, 
got your flask there, love. I hate doing the business when I'm dry. Here, Mr O'Rourke, a drink for an honest burger of the great city of Liverpool. That's very interesting, that little tale you've just told me. Happened to be passing the shop, picture in the window, wife's birthday, etc. Decided to look me up. But unfortunately for you, there's just one thing. I don't vote, Mr O'Rourke. I'm not on any electoral list. And the name on my shop is not Rate. I see by your face you've realised your mistake. Bang, bang, you're dead. Or are you? Have you given my wife this address? No, 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 I haven't. Then you're not dead. Not for the moment. My wife hates men. Most women hate men. You find this being married yourself? Well, I... Uh... Jack London said that a man who can keep away from drink and women can live very cheaply. Not that he ever managed it. Poor Jack. Was he a mate of yours? In some ways, a great mate. Though the level we commune on is not necessarily one you would understand. I mean no insult you appreciate. Just a statement of fact. Sounds a bit like Inspector Crust, actually. When I set up, he came to check me over. A bit of a query who stuck in my mind. Set up what, Mr O'Rourke? Let me tell you my side. Some years ago, in the psychedelic 70s... My wife and I opened a recherche little bijou establishment in London. Are you following this? Every word. As often happened in those days, one place led to another and suddenly we were rich. Have you ever been rich, Mr O'Rourke? Don't let anyone tell you it makes you unhappy. I wanted to cash in, seeing the writing on the prescriptions. My wife wanted to write it to the end. So she did ending up in a not very glamorous sackcloth and ashes number in Holloway. Now she wants half of what I got out with. She's not getting it. I struck a deal with her to find you. I've just set up as a private eye. Wait here. Help yourself to another. Mr O'Rourke... Would I insult you if I offered you money? Not necessarily. For silence? I sort of try to explain about that. You see, I gave her my word. You know, it's a professional thing. You've also just begun. And when people are just beginning, Mr O'Rourke, they usually have to do things that later on they shake their heads at in others. Here, at least hold the envelope while you consider. Now, you spoke of a painting in my shop window. A ship... In a stormy sea. Oh, the work isn't under glass, completely open to abuse. In fact, possibly the only genuine thing at this stage is the signature. However, meet me halfway and it's yours. Not that I'm an expert in the arts. Usually I simply draw conclusions. Which are? That you'll be charitably silent on my behalf. Show acquiescence and goodwill until I go. Go? South first, for a beaker full of the warm sun. Then New York where once more I'll deal in the artefacts of the past, the memento mori of those artistic tongues that now are silent, but which still speak and say, thus it was, thus we suffered. Yeah, right, well, uh, Curly's waiting, so... Uh... I'll see you out, this way. What sort of car do you drive? Oh, dear, Mr O'Rourke... Appearances can be decisive. Force yourself up market. You'll soon be long there, naturally. Buy from good rummage sales rather than provincial outfitters. Never take anyone's post-dated checks but mine. Remember, I've got your interests at heart. Nice evening. go. Bloody rain, as well as everything else. Still, there's been nothing straightforward about Ronnie since the day I met him. Right, how do we get in? Uh, problem doll. Bars on the windows, intercom at the door. 
Even if I could get on that roof, I don't think I'd fit down that chimney. Bugger, you got to start watching those videos. Look, why don't you just ring the bell? Oh, say who, darling? Prince Charles? I wish I had one of his polo sticks. John O'Rourke, Dumbo! Why have we stopped? Two things. Rate went in another room. While he was in there, through the crack in the door, I saw a picture on an easel. An old one in a gilt frame. About the same size as that thing of Adrian's back at the office. Well, how does that affect us? I'm not sure yet. Oh, great. Now, what's the other thing? This envelope. I've got to return it to Rate. What's in it? Our future. Bloody weather. Still not answering, Liz. He will. He's turning over who or what's outside. Yes? Uh, O'Rourke again, Mr Wright. Wait. Now, Mr O'Rourke... Out oh. you come, Ron, where I can see you! Oh. 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 But not too much, Roger. Not too oh, much. Oh, what are you doing, Liz? Let go, will you? Roger, I was married to him. All the more reason. He's like this, got no idea how to treat a woman. Here you are, old son. Right, Ron. Before I lose my temper, where's the dough? Bugger, they're back. Oh, don't you worry about that, Liz. Nothing a lot more than a nice pair to play around with. Know what I mean? Nudge, nudge, wink, wink. You're on a bloody bin, Bogger. You know that. Get him! Oh, oh, oh. No, oh. it's the other one, the one that posted oh. the road. Oh. Him with the hands of the Baskerville. Oh. Right, let's go. Bogger! Hang about, Liz. I ain't finished it. Am I, Ron? Come oh. on, you bloody nutter. Come on. Damn, Priscilla. Hector. Quiet, Andromeda. Hello, John. Everything all right? <laughs> you know how it is, Charlie. Curly, are you OK? How about that chap on the floor? Your missing tenant. I hope this isn't you persuading him to vacate the property. <laughs> it's more his ex-wife trying to persuade him to vacate life. Uh, like most seamen, I've always had equivocal views about marriage. Give us a hand to get him into the car, will you? Come on. <laughs> My office. No hospital. No hospital. <laughs> oh, yeah, well... All the best, John. I'll keep in touch. My regards to your lady. Chris, was it? <laughs> Come on, Chris, yes. Andromeda, that's bad for you. Come on now, chaps. Right, take him, John, when I get the door open. Oh, he's out again. Now, the other arm, John. Yeah. Then we can oh. get him in the back seat. Oh, there's one of his shoes off now. Just throw it in the back when we get him in. Last time we saw a pair of platform soles like this, Elton John was on him. Clearly, just heave it and him into the car and let's get back to the office. Even if Bogger holds off for a bit, the weather won't. Oh. Oh. Mr. Reid? Oh. Are you awake? Oh. How are you? Walking wounded is the expression, I think. Those things on the walls. Oh, John's art gallery. Oh, no wonder he wanted to buy one from me. It was for you, I presume. Me? Um, I'm, uh, I'm Chris. He said for his wife. Oh, talk about indignity upon indignity. Beaten up on my own doorstep, driven through the streets in an uncustomised car, now surrounded by the works of a part-time embalmer. <laughs> it's enough to drive one back to TM. Hmm? Transcendental meditation. Oh, yes. Ever been to India? Only via a tea bag. You fancy a cup? I'm a person of fixed habits, especially in the morning. Oh, where are my shoes? What about your face? Bogger, like the mills of God, grinds exceedingly small, though like any other large clumsy machine, he needs time to warm up. 
What you see is merely surface damage. You know him? Bogger is the guy who stole my woman, as they say, and as usual now believes he's the injured party, which in Bogger's mind translates to killing me as painfully as possible. That John's bathroom behind the partition, I need a shave. Um, it's his bedroom, but there's a sink and a geezer in there. Uh, things are a bit um, primitive at the moment. Oh, nothing wrong with roughing it at this stage. Give him something to boast about if he makes it. I've been into it with him, given him a few pointers. If? If he makes it? Come and talk while I shave. Scrape the grape. I'm not here for long, unfortunately. Are you going somewhere, then? America shortly, the land of promises. Let's hope some of them are kept. If the bomb disposal people saw this geezer, they'd cordon the area off. <laughs> But first, a short time in the sun to heal old wounds. Single bed, bachelor quarters. You're no more his wife than I am. I never said I was. The Canaries, perhaps? Somewhere not too far. Though just far enough. You been there? I've seen the map coordinates and spoken to a few of those who managed to make it back. Ah, Krista, look at you. If ever there was a girl built for beaches and bikinis, pina coladas and the pine trees, wouldn't take someone like you long to get used to things, learn how it's done. I'll need a bank, by the way. We're surrounded by them, all empty. John's gone to fetch his dad. Ah, oh, very feudal. Oh, this razor has an edge like a broken bottle. Move across so I can see you in the mirror. Very nice. Very nice indeed. Now, what if I make you an offer no girl could refuse? You're in dreamland, Mr. Wraith. Oh, um, I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean no. There. A close shave. This razor. One of those you throw away, is it? Disposable. Let's get back where the pictures are. I'll just take this to the window. Celestial Vision, Adrian Mintz, 1983. They all go for that one. The old phallocentric conspiracy raises its ugly head again. John's OK, a born dryer. But shouldn't you be thinking of a faster model? Why are wheels and a luminous clock? You can bargain with your face at the moment, Chris. The only cure for old age is money. No, thanks. Only one thing for it, then, isn't there? <laughs> Check your account. Close it. Chris! Look out! Behind you! What? Oh! Yeah, I've just been up to the ward. They told me you were down here in the tea room. When I saw her, I started to shake. I couldn't help myself, so I came down here. Uh, scalp wound and concussion. Nasty, but she'll be out in a week, they say. Oh, these places are like refugee transit camps. I'm losing all track of this. I want you to get your coat, Mr O'Rourke. Come with me. With you? Where to? Whatever my magic carpet, or warrant card as it's known, wants to waft you. You're taking me in? Get your coat and come along. That's all you have to know. Drinks, gents. Ah, ta, George. Yeah, I just thought we'd come here to look at a few villains. Ah, sound as a Euclidean proposition. Aren't you going to pay for it? <laughs> you keep me young, Mr. O'Rourke. You really do. What do you make of it all? You think Rake was snatched from my place by his wife and bogger? Uh, no, no, son. What do you make of it? Well, if they did and didn't find the money on him, which they wouldn't, then they'd go back and turn his bungalow over. Did they? Mr. Cross? N no, they didn't. Which means Rate did it to Chris himself. But why? I mean, what did he want to hide? Mr. Cross? Uh, look, I'm busy, Minty. Can't you, as a criminal mastermind, see that? I just thought I'd say hello. Uh, freezing out. No weather to be skint, eh? <laughs> Some bastard pinched me Mac the other night, too, you know. That'll slow your sex life for a bit. 
nothing but running noses and steamed up windows. And the price of prescriptions. Good job I'm exempt, you know. Is there any point in this, Minty, or is it just practice for your next bail hearing? Me ma's over there having a Guinness. Wave, Mr Croster. It makes her feel good. Mrs Farrell! Dick is. I Billy's due out next week. Me ma wants to visit to explain about his room that she's let out but forgot to tell him, you know. But what with the fares being what they are and, and her insides being too delicate for buses, well, a, a tenner would cover a taxi, you know. You'll have to earn it. Anything, Mr Crust. Right. You've half a mill to get out in used notes. How do you go about it? Turn it into what? Some small, valuable. You see that programme the other night about stamps? Bits of paper the ragman wouldn't give you a blow of his bugle for. Unpercolated edges. Me ma's had me going mad rooting out old letters I sent her from inside. And them old paintings too. Of course. Here you are, Minty. Here's 20. Offered in all humility. Ta, Mr Crust. One thing before I go, uh, who's your pal? Uh, you see, me mum will want to know. That, Minty, is another great detective like myself. Uh, excuse me. Then it's in the container. It's got to be. I saw the shed super. Rate had come down and gone into the container with a large briefcase portfolio job. Whatever the money's been changed into is in there, all right. What about customs? Well, it seems if you invoice your stuff as bric-a-brac rather than genuine antiques, you can put in or take out as much as you want until the ship sails, which is tonight. If it ever gets round to it, there's a gale out there. And you're going with it? I've got to. Otherwise, I've done nothing in three months but make a fool of myself and get a lot of people injured. And I want rate. So it's not the cost-efficient shipper how many pesetas <laughs> to the pound a man weller for him, after all? No, that's just a blind. He's travelling with his assets. How do you get on board? The container-based perimeter wire has more holes in it than a Swiss cheese. Dockers make them to save walking round through the main gate. Dad's finding out from his mates about a handy one. How long will it be? the States? Five, six days. Guys often stow away. They slip off the other end with the stevedores. That's what Ray will try, then pick up his stuff from the other end. And Curly? Well, you see, these ships, the containers are on top, but there's what's known as a row-row deck, roll-on, roll-off deck. Like a car ferry, you get in from a ramp at the rear of the ship. You could hide a regiment in there, as big as a factory floor, and always chocker. Curly will be safe as houses in there. Say your goodbyes, please, visitor. And Crust? No, oh, he'll be there somewhere. Wouldn't be a show without Punch. But I'm going to be the one who finds the money. Crust is going to take me seriously. You too, Chris. In the end, you're going to rate me. <laughs> That's an awful pun, John. I'm in an awful position, Chris. Chris, come with me, love. Paris, a weekend together, see something different, real paintings, life, all that sort of thing. Time's up, visitors, if you wish. Saved by the bell. Only this round. I'm prepared for a long contest, Chris, and there are gaps in your defence. Oh. Visitors, now for the last time. Haven't your homes to go to? Ships to sail, away with you. Come on now. Right, Kelly, there's the gap. The ship looks massive, even from the road. Always looks bigger, more beautiful at night, just like barmaids. How near are they to finishing? Any time. That container waiting to be lifted must be one of the last. Mm. Having second thoughts. Here's the straddle crane for the container now. We'll go when it's lifted. Right, let's go. See you, Dad. Ta -da. Send me a card. Hang on, though. What about the car? Who's going to drive it? John? Curly? Don't leave me here, lads. John! John! Bloody hell. What's that? A scuffer? Where did he spring from? Oh, oh squad car over the road. Open down, sir. Uh, yeah, that's it. It just stopped. Run out of petrol, maybe. I'm not sure. Got a license, have we, sir? 
Not really, no. It's my son's car. Funny it should break down here, right outside the container terminal. All those valuable commodities waiting for the shippers, or any villain that comes along. Expensive cars, whiskey, antiques. Ah. Ah. And where is your son at the moment, sir? Phoning the RAC, the AA, perhaps? Well, officer, I don't think I'd be letting you into any secrets if I told you he was now on board that ship over there. Run away to sea, has he? That's that trouble with youngsters. Two teenagers myself. How old's your lad? Um, <clears throat> 41. Oh, dear. This is a bit different. Tell you what, sir. It's a wicked night. Why not let me drive you to the station, sort things out there? I'd thought of trying to pick up a cab. Besides which, if anything happened to you, Mr. Crust would never forgive us. Like that, is it? Sergeant Francis, he said to me, discussing matters, old Mr. O'Rourke is a gentleman it'd be a perfect pleasure to arrest. So open the door and we'll get you somewhere safe till it's all over. <sighs> Ooh, it's cold and dangerous tonight. But not as cold and dangerous as it'll be on board the sea spray. After you, Mr. O'Rourke. How's it look out there, Charlie? Charlie? In the study, Captain, looking over the charts. What do you think off the bridge? Rough. Likely to get very much rougher. <laughs> Nights like this, I know what you mean about a job ashore. <laughs> How'd all that go? You know, still undecided. One or two hitches since we last spoke. Well, I'd miss you, Charlie, no doubt about it. One of the old school, like myself. Majority of these days I wouldn't carry as ballast. <laughs> Finally got to see the chap renting the place, did you? Oh, I got to see him. Whether he saw me is another matter. Lying on the floor covered in blood when I left. On um, second thought, stay at sea. Engine room want to know if we're going. Well, it depends what the pilot says. Uh, we've got a standby, anyway. Any coffee in the chart room? The ramp door's closed. We'll be off shortly now. That wind sounded a gale out there. Hey, I wonder where Ray's hiding out. Dad thought he'd go for a lorry cab. Above ground level. Difficult to spot. Oh, just look at it. It's unbelievable all this. Should be in one chip's old. Lorries, cars, tractors, timber, combine harvesters. A thousand places. A thousand shadows. Hey, John. Huh? Over there. Who? Crust? Right? Where? Oh, it's okay. They've gone now. Are they? Who? Mrs. Wright. Boggy. Look, Inspector Crust, where are you now? Pilot's here, sir. Thanks, Charlie. Ah, uh, pilot, uh, Captain Forbes. My chief officer, Charlie Rose. Captain, chief. What's the news? Port Radar says it's not going to get any worse immediately. As regards tugs, I've got you two up. And I can mm. get you a third. Are you going? For what chance another report from the lock? This is Ocean Sea Spray, Ocean Sea Spray. Conditions at lock, please. Hello, Ocean Sea Spray. Wind westerly, 5 to 6, gusting to 7, over. Thank you, lock. Over. Want to leave it another hour or so, Captain? See if conditions improve? The tide's going as it is. Water's running away. No, we'll chance it. Get the other tug up, would you, pilot? Uh, Charlie, tell the engine room we're going. Oh. And for God's sake, order plenty of coffee. We're going to need it tonight. Oh, we're moving again. Yeah, the pilot must have gone. Heading for open sea now. Feels like it. Oh, this rock in there. Yeah. I'd, uh, I'd better sit down. Here, yeah, this case. Crossed us. Where do you spring from? Deus ex machina. The god from the machine. <laughs> or lift from the upper deck in this case. Oh, do me a favour, Mr. Cross. Not at all. In classical drama, the god or hero from the machine, or crane, was a necessary device enabling someone to suddenly appear and unravel the plot. Wrote an essay on it just last week. Yeah, well, one of the complications for our hero is that Mrs. Rate and Bogger are here, looking to unravel a few things as well. Look out! Oh. 
It's beginning to look like an all ticket do, eh, Inspector? Then lucky I brought this along. That's a gun! I thought you were... believe all you read in the papers. Hold on. Oh. Blimey! What are Jason and the Argonauts doing up there, I wonder? Well, Charlie? Bad. Worrying. It's got much worse. All right, as long as we keep a nose into it. Roll side on in this seat, we'll throw a container. Look at this one. Down we go. And up we come. Shedding canvas. And drinking rum. We'll ring the engine room, Charlie. Reduce the slow ahead. You hear that, helmsman? Captain. Sir, we're losing way. She's turning beam on. Huh? Holy moly, the engine's stopped. Yep. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Sir? Yeah, thanks, sir. Right, as soon as you can. Governor's jam. How long did they say? Look out, Captain. Port side. Oh! Curly, where are you? Get down, Mr. O'Rourke. Where is he? Oh, yes, this timber. Oh. Just we did. Keep your head down. Look, no! Great. How come his lorry cap like a disturbed spider? What, what, what's happened to the ship? The engine? Uh, that's an educated guess. The last type she pitched, the drop came out of the water. Once it's out of the water, there's nothing for it to work again. It speeds up. This, of course, could damage the engine. So there's a mechanism called the governor cuts in and stops the engine. With the ship's stern re-enters the water, the engine usually starts again automatically. Which it hasn't. Only because Mr. Cross never had a hand design in it. Uh, by the combined harvester, Bogger and Mrs. Rate. Where? Hang on. It's going again! Oh, 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 we've oh, got to get out of here! Oh. What are you going to do with that gun? Rate spotted his missus and bugger. If I don't have Rate, he'll have one of them. Here goes. No! Look out, Mrs. Rate! What's happened? <laughs> Missed. But they know we're here. You made a mistake, young Curly. Rate won't let you off the hook so easy. Oh, Cross, oh. we've got to get out! This stuff moment's going to turn us into jam rolling pony! There they go! Bogger and Madame Pompadour heading for the access ladder to the upper deck. That was clean. Must have dropped his gun. There's a way up for us! Here! Access doors all the way along. Hold on! Rate again! He's going through the same door as them! He's going to shoot up at them! Stop him, Mr. Frost! No! Oh. Any good? Clipped him, I think. Come on! Oh. Where are we going? On, on top of the containers! Follow me! What'd they say down below? Another five minutes or so. I wonder we haven't thrown a container yet. One's right up for it, have taken a fair hammering. Have a look, will you, Charlie? We all secure up for it? Captain, this crew... You recall anyone with long blonde hair and a fair coat? Well, you know how it is these days. Who am I to pass comment? Otherwise, there's a woman on top of the containers. Good God, you're right. And two men. Small one with a gun trying to force the other off the edge of the container. These shoreside wallows will do anything for a bit of publicity. Imagine having to go back to all that. I'd think again about those kennels. Look out! Got, got rid of them, have we? Afraid not, sir. Hang on, there's three more just come out of the starboard access. What? One of those has a gun, too. Big chap. And the other. Well, I'll be damned. I thought I'd left all this sort of thing behind on the cruise ships. Something up? Fact is, sir, I think I know a couple of these blokes. It's this run we're on. This bloody North Atlantic. That and the monosodium glutinate. What are they doing below? Give the chief a ring, will you? <coughs> Shouldn't we do something, Captain? The people on the containers, I mean, for good or ill, I feel personally involved with one or two of them. The sea holds all the answers Charlie always has done. I don't usually talk in this fashion, as you know, but nights like tonight, full moon, raging seas, ship broken down, five madmen with guns on top of the containers, well, 
somehow brings out the philosopher. Why me, Charlie? Why? Come to look. Hell's bloody bells. One of them's grabbed the woman from behind. Who the bloody hell are you? Police. Oh, I might have known. Get where Epsom Salt would you lot. Well, do something. You got a gun? That, that bastard has one of mine. He's trying to kill Bogger. the small cove trying to force the other off the container has shot him again. You should look, Captain. I can't, Charlie. I'm a civilised man. But but the other bloke's still teetering on the edge. God, the bastard shot him again at close quarters. Now they're struggling. Oh, oh, here it comes. What's the score, Charlie? The two of them are gone. As is the container they were on. As us about three more from the port side. Engines restarted, sir. More bloody forms to fill in. How about the rest of them? Come on, Mrs. Wright. It's over now. They both gone. Come on, both. It's for the best. Come on. So Crust made the arrest after all. But I found the cash. I suppose we're going to have to hear how. Uh, that tea ready, Curly. Everything in general on the boil. Come on, John. The most puzzling thing was Rate's behaviour here. I mean, why wreck the office? Tear the paintings off? Them? Given his behaviour on the containers, wrecking this place is hardly to be noticed. <laughs> As for the masterpieces of Adrian Mince, you've now got them out on the pavement in bin bags waiting for the dust cart. Yeah, well, I've had the place redone. That sort of reward Crust got me. But how did you earn it? Well, when we came to open Rate's containers, at first there seemed nothing but junk, all smashed and splintered. Only thing seemed intact were two Victorian front doors. Then I noticed the knocker. On the door? No, the other one, Celestial Vision. Right, uh, yeah. And the penny dropped. The reason Rate wrecked the office was to steal Celestial Vision. A clip-on, clip-off frame. What he did was to turn the half million into another painting and slip it behind Adrian's green boob with the eye. Oh. An early Italian piece it turned out to be. Sophia Loren. No. Oh. <laughs> Once he'd got to America, right, he'd simply reclaim from his container what looked like a real piece of bric-a-brac and then take the good one from behind it. Simple as that. Well, Chris, how did I do? Enough to earn a weekend in Paris? Oh, certainly enough to start me considering it. Hey, that's my sister, your proposition. <laughs> <laughs> what the hell's going on? Have a look out of the window, will you, Curly? There's a dozen or so bikers. There's more chains on than Marley's ghost. Hey, they're looking up. Hey, they're coming in. A couple of big ones. <clears throat> Afternoon, lads. Any way I can help? Where's the dick? Yeah. Oh, John O'Rourke, private investigator. I want you to find something. Something gone missing. Yeah. Oh, glad to oblige. Uh, let me give you a card. Why? You Paul Daniels or something? <laughs> nice one. <laughs> OK. Now, uh, what is it? Paintings. Paintings? Yeah. You must be joking. <laughs> well, this is where I came from. You've come to the right want? place. Thing is, lads, I've just cracked a big one revolving around paintings. You know, money, heavy mobbing from London, shoot out at sea. Mm. Just finished sorting it, in fact. So now you can sort this. OK. Name, please? Mince. Adrian Mince. <whistles> See what I want, Scratcher. Yeah? Right. Go to the window, like aid. Oh, yeah! <laughs> it's ham and eggs. He's been in them bin bags lying on the pavement. Holding something up. You better come and look at this, eh? Oh, no, the paintings. You ready for action, Scratch? Impress me here, John. You can take me to Paris any time. On second thoughts, book the tickets. Maybe we'll convalesce there. Just another night. Monkey on my back. 
hepatitis B. Wife's begun to pack. Just another night. Trying to turn a bob. Things go on like this. Have to get a job. In O'Rourke's first case by Vincent McInerney, John was played by Ken Cumberledge, Curly by Dominic Rickards, Chris by Maureen O'Brien, Mr. O'Rourke by Richard Tate, Mrs. Raitt by June Barry, and Inspector Crust by James Ellis. Bogger was David Googe, Raitt, Eric Allen, Charlie, Jonathan Nibbs, Minty, Bill Monks, the Captain and Adrian Mintz, Christian Rodska, the Barman and the Compare, Ian Target, Scratcher, David Lerner, and the Telephone Operator, Marian Ellor. The song, Just Another Night, was written and sung by Vincent McInerney, and the Nergs were Steve Wright on guitar, Dave Dover on bass, and Steve Bartley on percussion. O'Rourke's first case was directed in Bristol and Liverpool by Sean McLaughlin. P Division, code four one. P Division, code four one. McEnroy's Point by Peter Turnbull, dramatized by Stephen Mulrine. McEnroy's Point. So you didn't touch the body? No, no. Uh, apart from lifting her head out of the water, no. The ferry company guy reckoned she could be revived if it was less than five minutes since she stopped breathing. So he ran back up to his office to phone. Can we just get some details, Mr. Wyatt, isn't it? You were intending to board the ferry. Ah, yeah, the one that's just away, that's right. Well, that's my car over there, the blue Honda. I'm in the transport business, personnel manager for uh, Glasgow Red Ball, if you know them. I've seen the buses. So. You were down here on business? Hey, no, no, I have a few days uh, leave to take. The company has a use it or lose it policy, so I, I thought I'd take a couple of days, go and visit my sister. She lives in Ardentini. She's on her own, same as me. She's a retired primary school teacher. First day at her work, she stands in front of a class full of wains and she's Miss Wyatt. Forty years later, her last day at work, and she's still Miss Wyatt, teaching their grand wains. Mr Wyatt, about the body again. You just moved the head. Yeah, that's right. I pulled it up out of the water. Oh, it's in some state, I tell you. I mean, I'm no pathologist, but that woman had stopped breathing a hell of a lot more than five minutes ago. Is it, is it crabs that do that? Could be fish. Jesus. I mean, the mess to your face. It's like it's been chewed. Well, if she's been floating in a clyde a few days, a shoal of mackerel wouldn't take long to strip a corpse to the bone. See, you wouldn't think fish would do that. Anyway, I don't think I'll be visiting Rachel now. The thought of cherry cake and tea. Uh, no, no, I'll get back home. I'll give her a phone. She won't be that bothered. God, I just stayed put in the car. I'd have been in Argentina now. I'd have been reading about this in tomorrow's papers. Ah, come in, Richard, sit down. Sorry I'm late. Tail back on the M8. Busy night? Not too bad, sir. A couple of car thefts, burglaries. Oh, and the night shift pulled in Mr Pollock, no less. They did? He's in the cells now, cautioned and charged. He was well wedged, about £15,000 on him. 
No mention of the rest? No, sir. He seems to have been buying silence from a lot of people, and that's one expensive commodity. Anyway, a beat cop spotted him walking through the city in the small hours, probably going from one safe house to the next. I presume his brief's been here? Oh, yes. He was down here like a flash, four in the morning, full of his clients' rights. Mm. You know, sir, what gets me about lawyers is the way they'll fight tooth and nail for people, even when they know they're as guilty as sin. Yeah, well, it's not Pollock's rights he's after, it's his money. Fifteen thousand, you say? No mention of the other 25? No, sir. Hmm. Easy come, easy go. Uh, he's only been out of Peterhead a year since his last ten stretch. Well, I'll go down the cells and have a wee chat with him. Anything else I should know? Well, there's a file here, sir. It's probably the priority. A woman's body fished out of the Clyde this morning beside the ferry slipway at McEnroy's Point. She'd been in the water a few days. Mm. Hamilton and Piper went down and Dr Chance had a look. I authorised removal of the body to the GRI for Dr Reynolds' attention. What do we know so far? Not much, sir. The body's a bit of a mess. But she's Caucasian, possibly middle-aged, blonde hair, about 5'9 or so. Is there anybody at the GRI? Uh, no, sir. It came in just at the handover. And it didn't seem to be as urgent as some. No, no, no. Fair enough. It's not recently deceased and there's no telling where the locus might be. Anything suspicious? Well, a few things, sir. For a start, she wasn't swimming, and I doubt if she fell off a boat. Wrong time of year and wrong clothes. I should say, sir, she appeared to be in her nightwear, pyjamas and dressing gown, and if it was suicide, I'd expect her to be in her street clothes, even just to get from the house to the water. Mm, well, I suppose she could have driven like that, but yes, I take your point. Doesn't feel like a suicide. What have we got from missing persons? Well, sir, the collator came up with two names going back a couple of weeks, given the state of the body. One's a Sadie Kinnear from the Hag Hill area, about the right age, height, and so on. The other one is a Mrs Neville. She and her husband are both missing. Oh, that's interesting. They were reported on Saturday, and again, the basic details are right. But this lady and her husband live in Gurukh. Gurukh? Yes, sir, that's what I thought. It's just about on the doorstep. Mm. And what strikes me, sir, is that if the husband and wife are missing and we've found the wife, do we assume that Mr Neville is floating face down in the Clyde even as we speak? This is possible, isn't it? Who reported it? A daughter, apparently. Paid them a routine visit at the weekend, found them gone, no explanation. Anyway, I think we're looking at Mrs Neville. The other lady, Mrs Kinnear, failed to return after a trip to the local shops, so she would have been in street clothes. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm, I think you're right. You're on the day shift, Richard? Yes, sir. DS Sussex and DC Abernethy are on the back shift. DC Montgomery was just going off nights as I came on. Oh, yeah. So, what's for action? Well, we've put out missing persons posters for all three, sir. Right. Uh, I think I'll look in at the GRI. They like a police presence. It's not strictly necessary, but it's a good idea. Uh, Dr K's already got the deceased's clothing at Pitt Street, sir. Fine, I'll give her a call. <clears throat> Meanwhile, he could phone the river police. Advise them there's likely to be a floater out there, somewhere off the tail of the bank. P Division, DC King. Collator, Mr King. Your inquiry earlier this morning. Mm. I've done a bit more digging. And there's a cross-reference you might be interested in, on Mrs. Neville. Ah, oh, just a sec. Right. OK. It might be nothing, but she's a sister-in-law of one Claude Neville. Claude Neville? That rings a bell. Doesn't it? Anyway, it wasn't in your patch. It wasn't sterling. But the papers were full of it, round about July. Old chap, left in his own, died in suspicious circumstances. And left a huge amount of money, if I remember rightly. A five hundred thousand, give or take. <laughs> Aye, I know which I'd prefer. Is there any detail? No. Our files just say cross affair to Central Police, Claude Neville. Could be nothing. Well, thanks. That's worth chasing up. Yes. You might even get a trip to Sterling. <laughs> anyway, hang on a sec, there's more. This Neville family seems to have a dark past. Mm -hmm. The son committed suicide about ten years ago. Went for a one-way swim in October. Guess where his body was washed up? McEnroy's Point. Got it in one. This is a real can of worms, though. The daughter tried to have a parent's charged with murder. Claimed they drove him to take his own life. The daughter? Yes. There's actually a statement in the file. 
But the fiscal just put his pen through it. End of story. <laughs> well, maybe the beginning. I hope you don't mind, Dr. Reynolds. I wouldn't want you to think I'm pushing you for a result. No, no, not at all. I wouldn't allow myself to be pushed in any case. They say a pathologist is the only doctor whose patients feel no pain. So we're never in a hurry. <laughs> or at least we shouldn't be. Uh, do you know much about drowning, Mr. Donahue? Uh, uh, not a lot, no. Diatoms. I'm sorry? Diatoms. We beasties that live in water, they're the key to it. If you drown, you inhale them and they find their way into the marrow of the long bones. Of course, that'll establish whether or not you were alive when you took the plunge. <sighs> At least that was the theory. According to the latest research, we're inhaling diatoms along with the air we breathe, so they might be in the bone marrow anyway. <laughs> See pathology. See exact science, eh? <laughs> ah, well, I'll make a start. You'll uh, need a mask, Mr. Donahue. Uh, the alcohol wash cleans off the surface pollutants, but it doesn't quite disguise the smell. Can't be expected to. You take milk? Mm. Aye, it's always nice to get a visit from Big G's finest. There we are. I'm D.S. Cushman, by the way. D.C. King. Cheers. So, I'd say to what do we owe the pleasure that I gather from our uniform bar you're inquiring about one Claude Neville later this town. Mm -hmm. What can I do for you? Well, we had a missing persons report on his brother and sister-in-law. Aye, that's John Neville. I think the wife's name was Charmaine. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we're fairly certain we've found her. We've taken a corpse out of the Clyde at Gurick, very near where they stayed, and we think it's her. What can you tell me about your chap, the brother? I understand you left a lot of money. Aye, well, Claude Neville was a sort of odd character. I wouldn't want to call him a recluse, because that would give the wrong impression. We didn't socialise. We had a fantastic house. I mean, really beautifully furnished. In the middle of what you and I would call a park, and he thought of as his garden. You know? <laughs> Humble origins, apparently. Brought up in some god-awful orphanage, but he certainly made up for it in later life. And he died in July of this year, suspicious circumstances? Aye, high summer. No, that's one of the circumstances. If you remember the case, his housekeeper found him dead in his bath. That's right, electrocuted. I remember something from the papers. Aye, an electric heater in the bath alongside him, plugged in a long lead to a socket out in the hall. I mean, it's common enough. Lots of people take baths in July with electric heaters perched in the soap tray. Oh, sure. Most natural thing in the world. Aye, that's what we thought. That's as far as we got. The fatal accident inquiry returned an open verdict, so the case remains on file. I can see why. The thing was, there was no sign of violence or forced entry. He'd been in the bath a few days. The body was covered in maceration. Uh, maceration? Aye, that was a new one in me as well, till I attended the PM. You know the ripple effect you get in your fingers if you soak in the bath? Mm. Mm. The technical term for it's maceration of the skin. It starts in the fingers after about 20 minutes. As far as Claude Neville was concerned, all the bits of him that were immersed looked like sand dunes in the desert. It'd been like that for about three days, the pathologist said. The bathroom was full of flies as well. The cleaning lady said she knew what she was going to find before she even opened the door. Hmm. Oh, the bathroom door wasn't locked on the inside? No. Well, there's no need to if you live alone. Uh, any theories? Well, Mr King, you're asking me to stick my neck out, but I do have my suspicions. And? Claude Neville's niece. That's his brother's daughter. Name's Charlotte. All the C's, eh? Anyway, the niece was known to be in the Stirling area around the time of Claude's death. Booked into a hotel room in the town, one night only. But within the 72-hour time frame, the pathologist said the accident had happened. So she was questioned, obviously. Aye. She wouldn't say why she was in Stirling, but she could easily have got home to Glasgow, 45-minute drive. Mm. And he was definitely electrocuted, not drowned. Aye, no water in the lungs, no bruising. Which she'd have expected if she'd burst into his bathroom, sat in his head till he drowned, and chucked the heater in to muddy the water, so to speak. And she could have done that? Oh, sure. Big, raw-boned woman. And he was decidedly frail, suffering from some chronic ailment. No, if she did anything, it was to walk into his bathroom with a glowing electric heater and drop it into his lap before he knew what was happening. You said the cleaning lady discovered him? Aye, that's right. 
The niece was highly indignant we had her in the frame at all, said her being in Stirling was pure coincidence, and she had no possible motive anyway, since she wouldn't stand to benefit from his death. Who did benefit as a matter of interest? Actually, her parents. Claude's brother and sister-in-law. They got around half a million. There'll be another couple of hundred K once the house is sold. This time of death... Aye, we've got 2.30pm for that on whichever day an electric clock stopped when the mains fused. I can't see somebody walking into the house by chance just when he was having his bath. Well, they wouldn't need to. The house is about six times the size of Balmoral. Well, that's an exaggeration, but you could easily hide yourself in one of the rooms and just bide your time. Hmm. The cleaning lady did say the heater was alien to the locust. Brought in for the occasion. Aye, aye it was an old appliance, probably bought second hand. So the instant that heater hit the water, Charlotte Neville's parents were richer to the tune of about 700k, and now they've disappeared as well. You know about her brother, of course. Yeah, she blamed them for his death. You could do with reopening Ms Neville's box, I think. I think so. Where do we find her? Well, your best bet would probably be your internal telephone book. Eh? She's a police officer. D.S. Neville, female and child unit, Q Division. Well, late fifties, I would say, certainly. If it's who we think it is, she'll be sixty-three. Oh, indications are she's been in the water for between two to six days. Maceration at an advanced level and uh, face and other parts of the body attacked by marine predators. You couldn't possibly narrow the time window, Dr Reynolds. Uh, no, I'm afraid not, Inspector. Not on what we have at the present. Uh, cold water at this time of year would have impeded the rate of decomposition. Build-up of gas has been slow. But uh, the stomach will tell us something. Uh, uh, if you'd like to stand back, uh, might switch on that fan just behind you. Ah, uh, it's not attar of roses, is it? Well, there's uh, no water in the stomach, so uh, so she didn't drown. Really? Well, I'll check the lungs, but I'm pretty sure there'll be no water there either. So if she didn't drown, what killed her? Oh, wait a minute. This feels wrong. R right, uh, look, Inspector. See this? A raised line? didn't spot this at first because anti-mortem wounds will actually leach into the water. The blood will flow out rather than congeal. I think if we'd found this lady on dry land, her hair would have been a mass of congealed blood. That the sweet waters of the Clyde have cleansed the wound very nicely. So just move the skin back. Ah. Yes. Oh, there you are, Inspector. There is your cause of death. Clean fracture of the skull, sort of thing you get from a, a pickaxe handle, say, wielded with some force. That'll be my finding, I'm pretty sure. Fracture of the skull causing subdural hemorrhaging. Oh, and uh, another weak point. Uh, she was tied up. She was? Yes, uh, just here. You see? Left ankle. That line all the way round, it's cut quite deep into the flesh. Uh, very likely at the same time as the head wound. An educated guess. Well, I, I'm not one to stick my neck out, but I'd say this lady was served a single pretty hefty blow to the side of the head which killed her outright. She was then dumped in the Clyde with a weight attached to her left ankle. This kept her submerged for a number of days, how many I couldn't say, but she eventually slipped her anchor and floated to the surface. And if it is Mrs Neville, then her husband's disappeared as well. Aye, and the likelihood is he's still down there, still attached to whatever weight was fastened to his limbs. I, uh, I can't help much with ID right now. Uh, fingerprints are out of the question. Uh, too much maceration. I'll uh, remove the lower jaw, though. Send it to the dental hospital. They might be able to match it against whatever records they have for Mrs Neville. Uh, well, if you'll excuse me, Dr Reynolds, uh, I don't think I'll stay for the next stage. All oh, right. Uh, suit yourself, Inspector. I'll uh, fax through a full report as soon as I'm done. Anyway, next day I walked across the road expecting to find more rubbish. But that's a puzzling thing. There wasn't any. 
Just an inflatable dinghy, shredded. Cut up, you mean? Oh, yes, Sergeant, in tatters. Mind you, inflatables occasionally get caught up in the propellers of a tanker, see, and eventually drift ashore as a mess of rubber. So in a way, I thought nothing of it. Until I heard on the radio about the body being found at McEnroy's Point. And that's when I contacted you. Well, I'm very pleased you did, Mrs O'Brien. So, which night was this? The night of the rainstorm, Friday. I couldn't sleep with the rain drumming on the roof. But it would be about 3am, so Saturday morning, really. Uh, anyway, I heard a van or something pull up on the lay-by, so I got up to take a look. It was a black van, one of those with a side door. And I couldn't see too clearly, but I got the impression of somebody carrying something down to the shore. Something quite bulky. How many people would you say? Just the one. Male or female? I couldn't be sure. They were certainly in trousers and big enough to be a man. No wee woman in a skirt, that's for sure. So four nights ago, during the heavy rain, if that was a body being carried down to ah, the water... Then... You're wondering, if a body was put in the water four nights ago, could it possibly fetch up at the point a few hundred feet to the west? Well, yes, it could, Sergeant. I don't know if you know much about rivers and such like, but they all have reputations. <laughs> According to Indian legend, for example, the water at Niagara Falls claims seven lives every year. And if you drown in Lake Superior between November and when it freezes over, it will keep your body. Down here, they say that no matter how long you're in the Clyde, it'll eventually put you back, more or less, where it found you. And do you believe that? Oh, yes, I do. My late husband was a yachtsman. He'd been sailing these waters most of his life. <laughs> I used to go out with him and he always said not to worry if I fell overboard because he'd always know where to look for my body. <laughs> With a 32-footer, Swedish built. That's why we bought this bungalow, in fact, to be close to the sailing. And we could see her from here on one of those moorings. Those are mooring boys, presumably? Yes. In summer, there's a yacht on every one of them. They're actually attached to a chain down to some immovable object, like a block of cement. Our mooring chain was fixed to an old locomotive wheel. They're not that far out, are they? No, the Clyde shelves very steeply here. Between the Yacht Club and McEnroy's Point, it's practically vertical and quite deep, upwards of a hundred feet. So somebody in a rubber dinghy could row out and drop a body overboard without much difficulty, apart from the rainstorm, that is. It wasn't really a storm, Sergeant. There was no wind. More like a, a monsoon, the rain coming straight down like stair rods, but otherwise calm as far as the water was concerned. The torn dinghy was big enough, incidentally, to take an extra body. A four-man design. And the Clyde might just have returned that body whence it came, you think? Well, that's what they say, Sergeant. Come on, old Sussex. Up you get. Coffee and toast. We're fresh out of fresh orange. Come on. Oh, oh God, what time is it? What time did you get up? We're due in at work in an hour. Case conference. So don't go back to sleep. Take this. Thanks. Oh, that's good. No, don't lie back. You'll fall asleep again. Hey. Hey, what are you smiling at? Nothing. Nothing at all. I was just thinking. You know, this is what a room and kitchen should be. A home for one, and it's just right. Not like the room and kitchen I was brought up in. I know, I know. You've told me. We were so poor, we had to... Oh, what was it again? Hey, Willems, don't mock. Well, really, you're getting maudlin in your old age. Yeah. And we're due in Donahue's office at nine. Remember? Aye, aye. You know your problem, young Willems. You have too much common sense. So... Richard, what you're suggesting is that this woman meted out a bit of rough justice to her parents, sending them to their death the same way they did with her younger brother. Well, it's a theory, sir. There's a lot of coincidence otherwise. And that would explain it. Right. Hmm. But she also pays a call on her rich uncle in Stirling months before and fries him in his bath to make sure that when she does do away with her parents, it'll be worth her while. Very calculating. 
Have you quizzed her yet? No, sir. We still don't have a positive ID on Mrs. Neville. Uh, no, sir. Dr. Reynolds was on the phone. The dental hospital were able to match Mrs. Neville's records. Oh, ah. Dr. Reynolds also mentioned other injuries, including a broken arm and several ribs. He's faxing his report through this afternoon. So the actual blow to the skull seems to have been part of a pretty violent assault. So it would seem. Of course, our problem is that the prime suspects are serving police officers. Yes, I know. And standing orders dictate that I've got to notify the chief superintendent before we take this any further. Hmm. What do you think, Ray? I don't think we've any choice, sir. No, I agree. But, uh, I wonder... Can we sit on that positive ID another day? Elka? Well, fax machines do run out of paper. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Mm. So they do. Yes, we can make good use of the time, I think, before our suspect discovers she's got a case to answer. So, if... If you take a look at this, Ray... I'll pass it to Mr. Findleton as soon as we're finished here. It's a summary of the case and my reasons for suspecting D.S. Neville of having committed murder. It'll be copied to the Chief Superintendent of the Court as per regulations. Yes, sir. And I'll have to notify my opposite number at Q Division as well, but I'll do that by phone. I'll warn him not to say anything to Sergeant uh, Neville. Not until we have a search warrant, anyway. Right, sir. So, what's the next move? Well, your interview with Mrs. O'Brien sounded promising. Uh, uh, I think we'd better get the frogman down there. I'll fix that up now, and uh, DC Abernethy can take over, OK? Yes, uh, sir. Uh, meanwhile, you and I will pay a call to the Neville house, I think. We will take Mr Bothwell with us, do a proper forensic examination. Right, sir. And uh, you can give Abernethy a rough outline uh, for the diver. Uh, well, there's a lay-by just over the road from Mrs O'Brien's house, and uh, I think I'd start about maybe 30 feet or so outwards from there. Get them to search among the yacht moorings. Sir... That's bound to attract press interest. Then Abernethy can stall them. They don't need to know what we're after. Not yet, anyway. Uh, but it's Mr Neville's body we're looking for now. Whatever you can find, Abernethy. Don't pick and choose. It's remarkably clean, sir. You wouldn't expect otherwise, I suppose, this sort of house. But this room in particular... Uh, look at these bookshelves, sir. You see? The tallest books to the outside and all graded down as far as the centre. Mm. Obsessive. Not the sort of room you could relax in for all its luxury. Nope. It'd be like walking on eggshells. <sighs> no sign of violence, though. Mr. Bottle? I think this room's been wiped clean. What do you mean? Well, maybe just a hug my day clean up in October, but the room's been wiped, sir. I'm certain of it. Take a deep breath. Let me know what you smell. Bleach? How about you, Sergeant? Oh, no, I can't smell a thing. Too many cigarettes in my younger days. Well, I think it's bleach. And if you stand over here, just where the sun catches it, you can see where a cloth's been wiped over the wall. Oh, yes, you're right. And either a tall person or else standing in a chair. See it, Ray? Here, wide sweep of the arm. Oh, yeah, that's quite clear. And just out of curiosity... <laughs> Poor hand. Smell this, Ray. See if you can detect the bleach now. Oh, certainly can. That's quite strong. You think that might be the murder weapon, sir? Well, I wouldn't presume. But I do wonder why anybody would clean a poker with bleach. Yes. Well, the point where the poker handle meets the stem is a good collector. And it's very hard to get rid of blood from these places unless you immerse it in a strong bleach or acid solution. Bit of inside knowledge. Possibly. Hmm. Anything in the rest of the house? Well, it's clean and tidy. Obsessively tidy, you might say, but there's no indication of this sort of clean-up anywhere else. One or two things even out of place, like an unwashed mug, for instance, in the kitchen. Really? Anyway, we know Mrs Neville died as a result of a very violent attack, possibly carried out in this house, and if that's the case, the lack of forced entry would suggest the victims knew their attacker. The victims, sir? Yes, her husband's also missing. We think he's probably at the bottom of the Clyde. Anyway, Mr. Bothwell, if you'd climb into your space suit and do your stuff. You're right, sir. And, Ray, I think we'll go next door and chat to the neighbour. I saw the curtains twitch as we walked up the drive. We'll start there. Yes, sir. Well, 
know I've been in the house 35 years now. Charlotte, the daughter, she was born in the same year I moved in, and her wee brother Charles, he was seven or eight years after that. Ten, in fact. Oh, ten years, was it? I'm getting confused in my old age. Anyway, I'm not sure I know what sort of family they were. You were on speaking terms, then? Oh, aye, but we didn't live in and out of each other's houses. Oh, they weren't that sociable. I think he was ex-military, long service. That's where he met her, as far as I know. Mm. The children didn't get an awful lot of leeway, I felt. You know, made to work and keep everything tidy. I mean, as soon as they could lift up a pair of shears, they were set to cutting the hedge, that sort of thing. A strict upbringing. Getting to be a thing of the past these days. Oh, for sure. The boy used to get some right hidings from his father, though. And I think the girl was frightened of her mother. Though I don't think she actually hit her. I was very fond of the wee souls, and I was quite often asked to watch them. Whenever she handed them over, it was always, now be strict with them, Mrs Lawrence. And I'd say, oh, of course, and then we'd have great fun. Over the years, I built up a toy box for them, and I think they enjoyed coming here. I'm sure they would. Aye. You know there was a tragedy in the family a few years back. Y yes, the son committed suicide. Oh, aye, that was the official verdict. But there's always guilt and blame flying around with these things, isn't there? It was just this time of year, in fact. He waded into the river at McEnroy's Point and swam out till he sank. Didn't announce it, didn't threaten it, just did it. His body was washed up very close to where he went in. But that's what they say about the Clyde, isn't it? So I've heard. Anyway, it was only after that I heard raised voices in that house. Never before and never since. I well remember sitting in this room with the windows open and hearing Charlotte, the daughter. You killed him. You killed him, she was shouting. Anyway, the verdict was suicide. The family wore black for a week or two and then carried on. Polishing the car, cutting the hedge. Hey, Mrs. Lawrence, can I ask you about more recent events? Uh, did you notice anything at all out of the ordinary at the Neville's house in the last couple of days? Aye, there was a van. Uh -huh. What sort of van? A dark-coloured van, about as big as the post office used to collect the mail. A fifteen hundred with? Oh, I couldn't tell you. It was a different shape from a post office van, but about the same size. Yes, so what uh, can you tell us about it? Very little, I'm afraid. But it was parked in the driveway for a few days. It looked really out of place if you knew the family. That's why I noticed, I suppose. I didn't see any movement, though, and the lights came on and went off at the usual times. You didn't inquire? No. I mean, you'd go to your neighbour's door if you heard breaking glass or something, but not for just a van in the driveway. Was Mr Neville's own car there? Oh, yes, in its usual place. The van was between it and the pavement. And you didn't see the Neville's while the van was there? No, but not seeing them for three or four days wasn't unusual. So, when did you last see them, Mrs Lunch? Together as a couple. It'd be a few weeks ago. But she was deadheading some flowers last week. And I saw Mr Neville, I think, the day before the van appeared in the driveway. The van had gone by Saturday morning. In fact, I think I maybe heard it leaving that night. The rain was keeping me awake. I heard it drive away. But I didn't hear it starting, funnily enough. You see how their driveway's on a slope? Well, as I say, all I heard was it pulling away from the road. Well, thank you, Mrs Lawrence. You've been very helpful. Well, what do you think, Ray? Jump start? Aye. In more ways than one. Still nothing, then? Uh, nothing. I think we'll have to call off for a while. The tide's getting too strong. Oh, I can put a team down this afternoon, though. Slack water's about 3pm uh, this time of year. And we'll be able to start diving again about half an hour before that. That'll give us uh, another couple of hours. I didn't realise it was that complicated. 
Oh, you're welcome to try it. I can kick you out with a wet suit if you like. No thanks. You're about blue with the cold yourself. Watch deep water. Another couple of hours should do it, though. From what I've been told, it's either going to be within a few hundred metres or else it's, it's nowhere. Sergeant Sussock! Sarge! Yeah, what is it? A few messages here for you, Sarge. Some chap called Mortimer. He's phoned about six times this morning while you were down at Greenock. Mortimer? Ah, let's have a look. Did you leave a phone number? It's on there, Sarge. Once you've got your specs on. Watch it, son. Oh, aye. I'll be one of these financial consultants. How to invest your money so everybody gets a piece. Little does he know, eh? Right, thanks. Look, I'll get round to it. If he calls again, tell him I'm still out. Okie doke, Sarge. Right, gentlemen, settle down. Settle down, Montgomery. Okay. Now, I'll try and summarise the case against before we interview Sergeant Neville. She's been informed about her mother, I understand, and we'll be talking to her tomorrow morning. D.S. Sussex and I have gone over the locus with Mr. Bothwell and we're waiting for his report. You're still with the diving team, Abernethy, I take it? Uh, yes, sir. Nothing doing so far, and they've had two goes at it. They reckon if there's another body down there, it could be anywhere. Mm. Well, it was only ever an inspired guess in any case. Right, then. Let's assume Charlotte Neville's our perp, and let's say she murdered her uncle about six months ago, meaning her own parents become extremely rich, inheriting nearly half a million pounds plus the Stirling property. She's nursing a grudge against her parents, however, for driving her younger brother to commit suicide, and this we've got witnesses for. So she pays them a call on Wednesday, batters the life out of them with a poker, and then bundles them into the back of a 1,500-weight van hired specially for the purpose. Uh, do we know anything about the van, sir? I mean, if we knew who'd hired it... No, Montgomery, I'm afraid not. Unless you'd like to do some checking, see how many firms in the west of Scotland rent out dark-coloured transit. Uh... Is there anything else, sir? Hmm. Anyway, the van has an inflatable dinghy in the back, plus weights and wire or rope to attach to the body. She loads them into the van, goes back into the house to sanitise the locus, and the murder weapon, we think, with a strong bleach solution. She's a cop, so she'd know that was important. Is she king of looking doubtful? Yes, I am a bit, sir. I think pretty well anybody would know to use bleach. I mean, if it goes to court, I imagine that's what a lawyer will say. Yeah, fair point. Anyway, she sanitises the locus. But she doesn't move immediately. She takes her time, does a thorough job, and keeps the house lights going on and off as normal possibly with timer switches. Either that or she stays in the house lying low. We can easily enough check a shift. Yeah, indeed. So, she waits for the right time to dispose of the bodies, and it comes like manna from heaven. Three nights later, pitch dark, rainy, and above all, a windless night. Nobody will be about in a night like that, but the Clyde will be like a mill pond. She seizes her opportunity, rolls the van down the drive and jump starts it, drives along to the spot where her brother took his last swim, dumps the bodies in deep water, cuts up the dinghy and gets shot of the van somewhere. And then on Saturday, she pays a routine call on her parents, finds them missing and reports the fact. And she won't even have an alibi. What do you mean, sir? Well, she won't, Ray. She's a cop. If she says anything, it'll be OK, prove it. Because she'll know how difficult that is. <sighs> I'd rather have an alibi merchant any day of the week, frankly. The stronger the alibi, the harder it falls. Anyway, we'll see what else Mr Bothwell can come up with. But the next move's Q Division. Yes? Chief Inspector Finlater called me at home last night. You can be sure of our full cooperation, Mr. Donoghue. I take it you'll be interviewing Sergeant Neville here? Yes, sir. I don't think there's any need to move her at this point. Well, I'll obviously want to be present when you talk to her. Of course, sir. You know, I hope your reasoning's sound, Inspector. Sergeant Neville's a very diligent, respected officer. Can't believe she'd be involved in anything like this. She's taken the news about her mother as well as could be expected. But I don't know what this will do to her. She is our prime suspect, nonetheless. Perhaps if we spoke informally to her? No. I think I'd advise her to insist on a pace interview. Properly recorded. Fine, if that's what she wants. Uh, before we go in, uh, maybe you could tell us about her shifts. 
she was off duty last week. The last shift was Tuesday back shift, and she didn't start work again until Monday. So, she wasn't at work during the days in question. That's right, Inspector. Okay. Sergeant Neville? Yes. Right. I'm going to ask those present to identify themselves. I am Detective Inspector Donahue, P Division. Chief Inspector Shade, Q Division. Detective Sergeant Neville, Q Division. Thank you. Detective Sergeant Neville, do you wish to be legally represented during this interview? No, sir. Sergeant Neville, I understand you've been told about the discovery of your mother's body early yesterday. Yes. And you know something of the circumstances? Oh, that she was drowned, yes. What I don't understand is why I wasn't told sooner. And what about my father? Sergeant Neville, we'll have time to ask questions later. What else do you know about your mother's death? Nothing. Well, the Chief Inspector told me her body had been washed up beside McEnroy's Point. That's all I know. I have a right to see her, and I don't know why it's you... It's all right, Sergeant. Just answer Inspector Donahue's questions. You know your mother was murdered, Sergeant? Murder? Yes. She sustained a fractured skull, among other injuries, before being put into the water. Oh, God. I wonder if you can tell us anything about that. Sergeant Neville? What? Your mother's murder, Sergeant. What can you tell us? I, I, I don't understand. Sergeant. There's... No, wait, wait a minute. I've just been told my mother's dead, and now I'm being accused of her murder. Is that what this is all about? I, I don't believe this. You had a rather strained relationship with your parents. Is that a question? All right, yes, it is. Answer the question, Sergeant. Were you on bad terms with either of your parents? No. Is that the truth? We had our differences. That They weren't the easy... We got on all right. Okay. Let's talk about your uncle, the late Claude Neville. How did you get on with him? Oh, God, not this again. I've been through all this with Central Police. You had a good relationship with him? Yes. You were a regular caller at his house? I suppose so. The family kept in touch. But you wouldn't necessarily stay at his house overnight, for example? No. Hardly worth it, so close to Glasgow. Yes? Yes. But you have on occasion stayed in a hotel in Stirling. Oh, I see now. You've been doing your homework, haven't you? Sergeant Neville. Answer the question, please. Yes, I've stayed in a hotel. And one of those occasions happened to be about the time of your uncle's death in suspicious circumstances. You know that. I also know you refused to give Central Police any reason for your presence in Stirling at that time. As far as I know, Inspector, I wasn't breaking any law. Did you visit your uncle that week? I did not. Really? Isn't that a bit odd? You could easily have looked in on him. Well, I could have looked in on him any time. I've told you we kept in touch. Sometimes my father, sometimes myself. Yes, but it's your visits we're interested in. I mean, Stirling's practically just up the road, isn't it? Three quarters of an hour's drive. Yet you booked into a hotel. I'm not surprised Central Police had their suspicions. And that's all they had, Inspector. Now, if you have anything we're more... We're talking about three murders now, Sergeant Neville, and that's one hell of a lot of suspicion. What do you mean, three murders? Your Uncle Claude, your mother, your father's still missing, but we'll find him, you do know that. You also know it's in your own best interest to confess and not prolong this. Confess? I've got nothing to confess, and if you think you can prove Sergeant otherwise... Sergeant Neville, I've known the fiscal to proceed on a lot less than we have. Like what? Motive, for a start. Means an opportunity. You were in the immediate area when your uncle was murdered, and make no mistake, we're still looking for his murderer. And all that stood between his money and you, half a million pounds, Charlotte, was your own mother and father. That's motive enough, I'd say. Would you? Would you? Would you kill your parents for half a million? Inspector, I wonder if we might take a break. Pace clearly states that an interviewee should be in a fit... I'm emotional... all right, I'm all right. OK, Sergeant. Let's talk about your relationship with your parents again. Isn't it true that you blamed them for your brother's suicide? Yes. I was upset. Even to the point of wanting your father charged with his murder? I've told you I was upset. 
My brother and I were very close. I think my father expected too much of him. My father was a professional soldier, you see. We were army brats, disciplined, stiff upper lip, everything by numbers. Oh, I've turned out well by my father's standards. But Charlie wasn't particularly clever or ambitious, and he wasn't the kind of man's man my father could respect. What do you mean by that? Inspector Donoghue, my brother's dead. His life, his short life, is no concern of yours or anybody else's. Let's just say that my father has his death on his conscience and leave it at that. Ah, but you couldn't, could you, Sergeant Neville? You couldn't leave it at that. You had a score to settle. I've got over it. Oh, yes. Time's a great healer, they say. But you've also had time to plan the ultimate revenge, beginning with your uncle's murder for money. For the half million pounds you now fall heir to with the death of your parents, and that process started, I believe, with that hotel reservation in Stirling, which you can't and won't explain. Inspector Donoghue, I wonder, can we take a break here? I know Sergeant Neville hasn't requested it, but I feel she should have the opportunity to reconsider her position on legal representation. No, I don't need... I think she needs some time on her own. But if she's already... All right. If you think it's necessary. Thank you. OK. Interview terminated at the request of Chief Inspector Shade at 09.52. Right. We'll leave you here for a few minutes, Sergeant Neville. Would you like a coffee? Please. We'll go along to my office, Inspector. Resume in what? About ten minutes? Fine. Sergeant Sussock. Yeah, something for me. Sorry, Sarge. I can't stall this guy any longer. He says he's been leaving messages all over the place and nobody calls him back. God, the financial consultant. Has he seen me? Afraid so. That's him over there. And the grey suit? Yeah, and the eager expression. Surprise, surprise. Oh, I'd better see him. What's his name? Mortimer. A uh, Mr. Roy Mortimer. Right. Uh, Mr. Mortimer. A patient man. <sighs> Can I come in? You didn't need to bring the coffee in yourself. Donna Hughes in my office. I can't stay. No. Lottie, we need to talk. I can't let you go through this on your own. You've got to tell him. No, I can't. You know what it'll do to you. I don't care. For God's sake, Lottie, you've got to stop him now, and it's the only way. You have to tell him. If the worst comes to the worst... This is the worst. You've got to. Yeah, sorry it's taking so long, Mr Mortimer, but we are very busy right now. Uh, have a seat, please. I can't give you much time, I'm afraid. I'm not really into all that investment, etc. <laughs> My life's a bit too complicated at present. Oh, no, Mr Sussex. I'm not here on business. Well, not in that sense. I'm not going to try and sell you a pension plan. <laughs> Actually, I think I have some information on this missing person case that's been in the papers. Oh? Uh, this Charles Neville, I think the name is. Uh, would you like a cup of coffee, Mr Mortimer? I wouldn't mind. Right. Uh, hello, uh, WPC Willems? Yeah. Uh, how would you like to join me with a pot of coffee and three cups? Eh? Yes, of course you have to bring them in. Thank you. Now then, Mr Mortimer, what's your connection with Charles Neville? Right. Interview resumed at 10.10am. 10 10 Present in the room of Detective Sergeant Neville, Chief Inspector Shade, Detective Inspector Donahue. Now, Sergeant Neville, these visits to Stirling, I get the impression that while you may have been on good terms with your uncle, this was not a particularly close family. Would I be right? I wouldn't say that. I'm not sure what you mean by close. Could it be that you went there to observe your uncle's movements, to get his watchdogs accustomed to you, to check out the cleaning lady's comings and goings? No, that's absolutely untrue. This won't go away, Sergeant. Do you know that? Sergeant Neville. All right. I wasn't in Stirling to visit my uncle. Sergeant, we already know that. At the time of his death, you were booked into the Wallace Hotel by sheer chance, as you would have us believe, in the same small town under an hour's drive from Glasgow. That was the whole point, if you must know. I can walk through the centre of Stirling and never see anybody I know. Any Glaswegian can. It was perfect. I... I don't understand. <sighs> all right, all right. Two Glaswegians, both serving police officers. Do you get the picture? 
Two serving officers, one of them married, a married man with a family in a very senior position? Sergeant Neville, are you telling me that you were having an affair? You were meeting someone in Stirling, and you were with this man in the Wallace Hotel at the time of your uncle's death? Yes. Are you willing to identify him? No. <sighs> you take sugar, Mr. Mortimer? Um, no, thank you. Um, this is fine. So, you're sure this is the same man? Absolutely. The photograph on the poster was very clear, and it's quite a distinctive face. That's Charles McRae, I'm sure of it. Oh, that isn't his wife, though. She's a much younger woman. French-Canadian, at least, that's what she told me. You met her? Oh, yes. They live in Ottawa, apparently. You see, my bank is Canadian, First National Bank of Alberta. We mainly deal with company accounts, but we do have a few individual clients with a minimum deposit of a thousand pounds. That's the minimum? Yes, small savers aren't really worth our overheads. Well, that rules me out, then. Mr Mortimer, this Mr McRae, as you know him, is he one of these clients? Yes. He opened an account with us about two years ago, deposited a thousand pounds and just let it lie. We don't offer favourable interest rates. Most of our clients need a dollar account, either US or Canadian, and ready access, so it's low interest and company accounts in the main. I see. You know, Mr. Mortimer, I get the feeling there's more to this than the poster. Am I right? Well, a few months ago, Mr. McRae suddenly became a regular depositor. Virtually every week, large amounts drawn from several different building societies. Sometimes he came in alone, other times with his wife. The French-Canadian? Mm. Yeah. A West of Scotland accent, though. Anyway... Over a very short time, Mr. McRae deposited nearly half a million pounds with us. Didn't that seem suspicious? Uh, well, we're not a high street bank. We don't question our customers as closely as they do. And we're quite used to large sums dealing with companies. But not with individuals? No. So a couple of days ago, I arrive at work to find an overnight fax from our branch in Ottawa, requesting that Mr. McRae's money be wired to them as he and his wife are now resident in Ottawa. It's very remiss of me, I know, but it was only then that I started to do some checking. I mean, it didn't add up. Our interest rate is less than inflation, a good deal less. Why on earth would anybody lodge half a million in an account with virtually no growth? Be as well keeping it under the mattress. Exactly. So what's the explanation, do you think? I think it's a very clumsy attempt to launder money. Ill-gotten gains, most likely. Well, as you can imagine, I was a bit puzzled. So I started checking, as I say, and the trail took me through practically every building society in Scotland. He had an account in each of them, all in the name of Charles McRae. And he was moving the money in batches of 20 or 30,000 at a time by check. And he incidentally left ten pounds in each account as he emptied it. I dare say because that was less trouble than closing it. And you traced all these? Well, I'm a, I'm a wee bit of a bloodhound, really. And uh, to cut a long story short, I eventually found the original source. And? The Clydesdale Bank in Gurick. An account in the names of Charles and Charmaine Neville. Checks drawn on that account were paid into the Fourth Valley Building Society to one... Charles McRae. Now resident in Ottawa. Of course. These cheques and all the others were made payable to McRae and signed by Charles Neville. Anyway, when I noticed that poster and saw the face of somebody I knew as McRae being named as Charles Neville a missing person, well, that just confirmed my suspicions. Something wasn't right. No, and that's putting it mildly. Mr Mortimer, I wish you'd caught up with me sooner. Well, I, I know you're a busy man, Sergeant. It might have saved us some time, and certainly some embarrassment. Ray, I think you ought to call the inspector at Q Division, don't you? Oh, God, aye, before any charges are read. you better do it now. Yeah. Uh, Mr Mortimer, you wouldn't happen to have a home address for our friend in Ottawa, would you? Hmm. I, I thought you'd want that. Elka? Sergeant, we're going round in circles here. 
You know as well as I do we'll get there in the end. You must give us a name. I can't do that. You'd go to prison rather than tell us who you were in Stirling with. It won't come to that. I'm innocent, that's what matters. You come forward if he has to. I know he will. But I don't want that, not yet. Come in. Sorry to disturb you, Inspector, but there's a phone call for D.I. Donahue. From P. Division. A Detective Sergeant Sussex. Yes, that's one of my team. He said it was very urgent. Possibly the missing... Yes, yes, I'll take it. Right. Interview terminated 10.48 a.m. That's in train now, sir. WPC Willems phoned Ottawa, faxed them the details in a photograph. We didn't think it was a good idea to wait. In view of the time difference, sir, before he left for work. Mm, or a golf course, more likely. And they'll respond as soon as they've anything for us. Yes, sir. Mm. Well, I don't mind admitting I wish we'd seen your man Mortimer sooner. My fault, sir. It's not having to apologise to Sergeant Neville, it's what we put her through. And it doesn't get any better, does it? Hardly. I think it's obvious her father would have let her take the rap. He maybe even knew she was in Stelling when he dropped that fire into his brother's bath. I presume it was him. I should think it's a certainty. Long-term plan. A sleeper account in this bank nearly two years before he has the money to fill it. Can you imagine anything more calculated? Probably started hatching it the minute he decided he would trade in his wife for this younger woman. After that, the murder of his brother. Brother, for God's sake! And then his wife, they were just... Stepping stones to a new life in Canada. Yes. I take it we've stood down the frogman. Yes, sir. DC Abernethy's already done that. Hmm. Missing person. Missing with intent. That could be Ottawa now, sir. Ah. The wonders of technology. I hope you've got paper in this thing. Wasn't that how they got Dr. Crippen, sir? Transatlantic cable. Uh-huh. Sir? Sure it wasn't the Mounties you phoned? In McEnroy's Point, the part of PC Hamilton was played by Martin McCarty, PC Piper by Paul Sampson, D.I. Donahue by Crawford Logan, and D.C. King by Liam Brennan. The Desk Sergeant by Jim Twadale, Dr. Reynolds by Paul Young, D.S. Cushman by Ian Agnew, and Mrs. O'Brien by Catherine Connolly. D.S. Sussex by Jake Darcy, W.P.C. Elka Willems by Eliza Langland, Abernethy by Andrew Conlon, and Elliot Bothwell by David Goodall. Mrs. Lawrence was played by Wilma Duncan, D.C. Montgomery by Stuart Macquarie, Mr. Mortimer by John Shedden, C.I. Shade by Alan Sharp and D.S. Charlotte Neville by Louise Beatty. Other parts were played by members of the cast. McEnroy's Point was written by Peter Turnbull, dramatized by Stephen Mulrine and directed on location in Glasgow and in our Edinburgh studios by Hamish Wilson. Now, you're going to find that it's hard to believe, but the man in the corner is about to be prized from his seat in the ABC Tea Rooms for a trip to the seaside with Polly, dropping off for several cream teas along the way, no doubt. But there's a mysterious case awaiting them in Brighton when a woman receives some strange letters from her husband, and stranger still, she thought he was dead. Ladies and gentlemen, we stalk a dark planet. We search for light. But it is darkness we delight in. We are creatures of paradox, and it is mystery that draws us. Behind the known fact, we search out the unknown. We will not rest until we are home. Good afternoon. Yes. Hmm, a desultory scene. Is it? The doldrums in the ABC, unmistakable. Hmm, then go on. Dried stains on a saucer says it all. Does it? Yes. Even if I hadn't found you stirring a cold inch of tea in the bottom of your cup. I was waiting for you. Hmm, you say that. The sceptic note. It all adds up, that's all I'm saying. Life as arithmetic, how reassuring. And your diagnosis? You are suffering from ennui. 
Isn't that something that only affects Frenchmen? Which means... I know what it means. Boredom is a serious ailment. Yeah, of course. And a cure? Life... Yes, Polly? ...is an ocean. We should not be surprised if from time to time our little boats are becalmed. And your cure? You sit here... I know I do. ...day after day... Everybody has to sit somewhere. With the same corner seat in the same cafe on the Strand. I like it here. You need to get out more. What? You need to... I heard. I just didn't like what I heard. Fresh air. Oh, I was afraid of this. What? Altruists take no prisoners. It's spring. It's February. I can feel spring. You know what you need? I know I fear what you're going to say next. You need a trip to the seaside. That's the world, that is. I've seen it. <gasps> those cows in those fields, look. Mm. Oh, the hill. <gasps> look at that tree. Isn't it... Oh, isn't it absurd? Not to me, no. What? Are you perfectly well? <gasps> and look at that cottage. Oh. Does that arouse your affection, Polly, that dwelling? Yes. You see how much we miss staying in London? I am surprised. Why? I've always thought of you as a city girl. Oh, no. Trees, hay, animals. I love it all. Good. And the sea? What? You view the sea with equal enthusiasm? The sea? Hmm. Oh, no. Then why are you taking me to Brighton? Oh, the sea! Oh, yes! Waves, splashing, more waves, more splashings, lovely! What? Interesting. possible to stockpile fresh air? You mean... At the risk of earning your disapprobation? Yes. Haven't we had enough? <laughs> We've only just got here. But do you like this? Do you honestly like it? What? This game. Uh, all right, where do you want to go? Well, I think I just saw over there... What? The inviting lights of an ABC. Well, of course, only if you're uh, so sure. I'm freezing. Ah. Oh. Well, it's not bad. You approve? Yes. There's nothing like the comforting surround of teak veneer. Why, Polly, we could almost be at home. The fact that it's the esplanade out there rather than the strand... Is of no significance. That's right. It's in here, inside, yes. where the true operations of life may be conducted, isn't it? Yes. So then... What? Why have you brought me here? Elizabeth Morton. Gone? I met her in America. Your San Francisco days, was it? Yes. She was... Well, the thing about the Americans is that you may find yourself mixing with a wider range of people than in England. I mean... It wouldn't be true to say that there's no class system there. I mean, what would be the point of being rich if there were no poor to look down on and despise and patronise? Of course, all that goes on. It's just that it's possible to meet a wider variety. She's rich. Very, very rich. Mm. Rich in a way the English haven't been for years. If money was a virtue, Elizabeth Morton would be an angel. So, in this egalitarian world... We became friends, mm. yes. Only her name wasn't Morton then, of course. That was before she met him. A letter. For you. I thought you were late. I am, yes, I am. Aren't you going to open it? Uh, now, why would I open a letter from my lover in front of you? Would you? No. Wouldn't you? That would be a, a little overindulgent. I mean, I like to live dangerously, but... Uh... OK. Typed address. Very neat. For anonymity. Mm, I like it. What? You jealous. You like it? It makes me purr. Oh, I'm going. Go on, then. Leave me alone with my letter. Well, what are you waiting for? 
I believe it's customary to kiss your husband goodbye. Do you? I believe it is. Not where I come from. Well, you're in my country now. Mm, you're going to be late. And Mr. Peabody will not be pleased. I don't care very much. Uh, his jowls will inflate when he sees you. M Morton, he'll <laughs> stutter with a... Hieronymus oh, oh, Bosch, have you been? <laughs> oh, open the damn letter. And what was it? Apparently, it was a letter from a man. I see. Do you? Well, her past, I take it. Of which we all have some, at least. Well, I'm not casting stones, Polly. I'm assuming you're coming to the point. As I said to you, Americans seem very friendly and open at first. And you thought you knew her? Yes. I saw her, ooh, three times a week for nine months. Oh. I met her parents, I met her brother, I met her grandmother. We talked about everything. And then, quite by chance, I found out she was married. My girlfriend was married and hadn't told me. And her husband's name? Le Comte d'Armand de la Tromouille. Sounds like something you might pop on your tongue with a glass of masala. Oh, I'm sorry. What? You haven't eaten, are you hungry? Uh, well, I... No, 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 I'll get you something. What, um... I'll tell you what I'd like. One of those slivers of pastry, I believe they're called Long the Shire. The taste of almonds, you see. It was, <laughs> it was the name, you see, that reminded me. Oh, right. Is, is that all? <laughs> and a cup of tea. I'm feeling better already, Polly. Must be all this fresh air. Hmm. Well, while I'm away, read this. Hmm. My dearest Elizabeth, what centuries since we met. I may only beg your forgiveness. You must think badly of me. I know you do. A husband who suddenly disappears without a word. You must hate me. Can you believe I still love you? I will explain all, though whether my story excuses me, only you may decide. I understand that in my absence you have married again. I was deeply shocked about this, though, perhaps without right. You assumed that I was dead. I am not. And now I reclaim you, my life, my love, and in law, still my wife. At first, he didn't ask for any money. Ah. Is that nice? Mm. Thank you. Now, I want to ask you, how did you come by this letter? She gave it to me. Hmm. Gave or sent? In fact... She's here? Yes. In Brighton? Yes. She contacted me. So this excursion... Yes. ...was not so much a concern for my health. Oh, she's in trouble. I wanted you to meet her. Did you? Do you mind? Do we have to move? No. She's coming here. And how does she know we're here? Ah, I see. You calculated after a long journey, what? finding myself in the fresh air, well, no. that I would seek the nearest, that I would be bound to seek the nearest. A, B, C. <laughs> yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> and when is she due? Three o'clock. Could I get you another, um, long de chat? <sighs> this is bad. Show me. I knew he would ask for money. Hmm. You said... Am I going to sound naive? What? It's only 50 pounds. Armand was a man who never required much encouragement. What does that mean? He'll come back for more. This is just a testing the water. You think we shouldn't pay? I don't know. Well, pay or don't pay. What do you mean? Well, I feel we don't want to be indecisive. I mean, is that not an encouragement? I can't think. Think for me. I know a man. What do you mean? He might help. Help us? How? You're saying you're, you're saying your husband, your first husband, that we'll never be free of him? He was a memory. Barely that, believe me. Then forget him. Francis, I don't know what you mean. Like a memory, like a bad memory, we have the right to erase him. Don't we? And then she contacted you. Yes. Mm. Well, what did she want exactly? Her husband. She told me her husband had got himself into deep water. And what is she expecting you to do? I am her friend. I see. And she knows about you. Ah, 
Well, of course, I told her. Mm hmm Are you annoyed? No. She said, could we speak to him, to her husband, to dissuade him from... She's very anxious, you see. <sighs> now, let's get our thoughts in order. A wealthy young American woman marries a French adventurer. He disappears soon afterwards. She assumes he's dead. He... Just after he left, he telegrammed her to say he was sailing on a ship, the SS Argentina. A few days later, it was in the papers, the ship had gone down. No one survived. She assumed she was a widow. Yes. She comes to England, she remarries. A man named Francis Morton, who... Uh, what does he do? He's a merchant banker. And uh, then she begins to receive letters from her first husband. At first, he asks her to return to him, but soon he's asking for money to keep quiet. How does her second husband react? He is younger than her. Yes. I mean, clearly, this is a factor. In? He's anxious. He's protective. Yes, yes. He suggests hiring a man to kill Armand. Uh, and she agrees? She was opposed to it, but what could she say? He insists. Yes. And now she wants you to speak to him. Yes. Do you know him? Have you met him? She knows nobody else. Why, why do I have to argue this? I don't know why I have to. If, if you don't wish to be involved... Oh, no, no. This is very interesting. I would have thought to, to help an old friend... Yes, quite. She's lucky to have you, Polly. He's coming. Francis. I tell you, he's coming here. I didn't want this. Nobody wanted it. I'd like to know if there's some other solution. Go ahead, think of one. Did you want to do this? What? No, listen, he's coming. It's been a shock to you. I'll tell you what, a man has invaded our lives. Our happy little lives. As though somebody had us by the throat. Now you... Now, you tell me an answer to that that does not involve his forcible removal. If you and the money, that's, that's when he'll stop. Will I fight to keep what I have? Oh, yes. Now, he's coming. Who is it? That's my man, Skinner. Hey, Skinner! I said we'd meet alone. I wanted her to see you. Elizabeth, this is Mr. Skinner. And the money? I told you, my price, what we agreed. You have it? That's all of it. I'm telling you. I'll count it if you don't mind. Yeah, it's there. When will we hear? When you need to know. Oh, wait, wait, wait! I think I need some reassurance. I don't think that's unreasonable. Read the papers. you what? Keep your eye on the papers. The next week. You won't need any reassurance. He'll do the job. Francis. He'll do the job. Mrs. Elizabeth Morton. How do you do? Oh, how do you do? Sit down, Elizabeth. I'm very grateful for your time. I wouldn't be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, tea? Coffee, please. And something to eat. Give me a doughnut. Elizabeth? Oh, nothing. Well, I'll uh, leave you together. <laughs> you are not as you are billed. I don't understand, Mrs. Morton. I was given to understand your character note was eccentricity. You don't look eccentric to me. Oh, I am. Are you? I catch trains to Brighton in February. Can you think of anything more eccentric? <laughs> I'm very grateful you've come. I'll certainly reimburse you. I don't want money, Mrs. Morton. Well, I didn't mean to insult you. I'm not insulted. And your character note, by the way, was secretive. I'm certainly not that. When you first met Polly, you didn't tell her you were married. Why was that? Nobody knew. Your family? Nobody. My father would have... He probably would have thrown me out there and then. Why? My father is in pork. He came up through the stockyards in Chicago... He bought a house on Lakeview Drive and sent his daughters to finishing school in Europe. He felt we owed him a decent marriage. <laughs> his instinct in that regard was as sharp as Henry VIII. And so the European Council... Oh, he wouldn't have minded the aristocracy, but he'd have had a stroke at Armand's bank balance. 
In Chicago, we prize bucks above pedigree. May I ask, why did you marry the Count? Why? Well... Why go to such lengths? And such a strain, wasn't it? The secret license, the nighttime liaisons. My father had me trained to be a ninny. Yes, I see that. I could speak three European languages. I had my culture off pat. But what had I done? You must have known you were laying yourself open to blackmail. I found that danger gave me an appetite for life. It was an appetite that had never been whetted in any art gallery or museum. But the bum ran out on me. I mean, I knew he would. I was just surprised at how soon. And then you heard he had drowned. Uh, the ship he was on, that he told me he was on, sank. I assume. Ah, yes. And I heard nothing. I came to England. Why? Yes, why? Why not stay at home in the bosom of your family? My family was never a bosom. It may have corresponded to an entirely different part of the anatomy, but bosom, mm -hmm. no. Are you having a nice talk? <laughs> Very nice. So, now, can I... Well, when did your father find out about your marriage to Armand? Soon after I heard he was dead, he found a letter. I told you that. Yes, yes. Elizabeth... I came to England. You fled your father's wrath. If you like. You must have thought your adventuring was over. I don't think that was the point. Elizabeth was desperate, and now... Until I met Francis, you could say I was a ship lost in the fog. You see? Last night, I had a dream. My husband Francis was in a deep and dangerous sea. I was on a small boat. I called to him, swim! I shouted, swim! But he couldn't hear. The sound of the waves, you see, and, and the wind. He loves me, and trying to protect me, he has entered a dangerous sea. He needs your help. Well, it's going to be more difficult. How? I said difficult. I don't understand. Well, this character, he's uh, moving around, isn't he? I said he's in Brighton. That's what I thought. You told me. I know what I told you. Well, then. Don't say well, then, to me. Mr. Skinner, I have given you money, haven't I? I said, don't talk like that to me. What, what is the problem? It's going to cost me more. What? How is that? Because of this difficult thing. So I have to pay more. It's become more difficult, I said. You can forget it, then. Oh, can I? I thought you needed me. Give me my money back. <laughs> what did you say? I don't like what I'm buying. You're asking for your money back? That's right. Well, you can't have it. Look, Mr. Now you look, OK? I took the money to help you out. Well, now it's gone. If you want the job done, it's going to cost more. That much is obvious. I want my money back. Go back to your wife. Go back to your little wife. Tell her. This man is still on the loose. Tell her that. I've got to think. I haven't got forever. Meet me here. When? Tomorrow? Same time? I can come. I'll have it for you. Don't worry. I'm your man. You were very brusque with her. Was I? Oh, I think if a person is suffering, the last thing they need is an interrogation. The facts, Polly... Are clear. This is not a mystery. You didn't like her, did you? It doesn't enter into it. I think it does. <clears throat> We need Polly to distinguish fact from illusion. It is perfectly clear. Is it? Yes. Is that the problem? Polly... Is that but... what the matter is? You are away from home, you are uncomfortable, and you are seeking the reassurance of familiar territory by asking questions that don't need answering. Sorry to be dull, but there is no mystery here. Very well. I'm sorry to say this, but I intend to meet her husband, with or without you. Francis... It's over. What do you mean? Skinner has... He's done it. What? What has he done? Elizabeth, he's killed Armand. <gasps> We're free. No, wait. I'm telling you. Where have you been? First he told me he couldn't find him, but Armand must have come back. Then Skinner came here. He said he wanted to show me something. What? To a... To some wasteland. You don't need to know. Francis, tell me, please. I went with him. It was pitch black, except for Skinner's lamp. I didn't know such places existed. The whole world's broken furniture, 
glass shards, pools of oil, rats scurrying. We turned the corner of a broken wall, and he stopped. He pointed to a small bonfire. What was it? Elizabeth. Armand. Was it Armand? I, I walked over to it. It was all ashes, except Elizabeth. I saw the bones. Oh. Skinner was smiling. He said, he said we would never be troubled with Armand again. Elizabeth. <sighs> What have I done? What is it? Sit down. Where is your friend? I don't know. He went for a walk. Is something the matter? No. I want to help you. I see. What? Your friend doesn't want to. I want to. Where can I meet your husband? What is it? Too late. We're too late. What's happened? Shall I get some tea? Don't leave me. So... I went home. What's happened? Oh, God. Polly. Polly. Wait. Was it my fault? Tell me. The man my husband hired has done his work. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I imply? Did I... Did I imply... What do you mean, Elizabeth? Was it my fault? I cannot help but think it was me. No. Did I do everything to stop him? It sounds as though he made up his own mind. <laughs> You tried to talk him out of it. You came here. You asked me to help. I know. I know. <sighs> what can I do, Polly? If you do nothing, you're an accessory. What? I'm telling you the facts, Elizabeth. You're saying I should turn him in? Is that what you're saying? Not... Uh, no, but... Uh, betray him? Betray him? He is everything to me. I... I've changed so much in his care. When my father found out that I had been married to Armand, I was relieved. I was already grieving. I believed that Armand was dead. I was distraught. And yet all the time had to pretend that nothing had happened. I nearly went insane. The illusion of normality, the tennis matches, the... The young men I was to see. Well, inside... How terrible for you. You understand, Polly. You are my friend. It was terrible. You see... You see, I... I loved Armand. I thought I loved him. I was 18. Yes, yes. He was so alive, so romantic. So different from everything I'd known. He... He said that life need not be this way, that freedom could be tasted and lived. And because of all that, I fell. And then the news came. Breakfast. My father reading the Chicago Tribune. The Argentina's down, he said, and turned the page. We carried on eating. My mother tapped an egg. And an earthquake was erupting inside me. So it was a relief hmm? when your father found out. Oh, yes. You are kind, Polly. Please. What did he say to you? My father. You remember him? Yes. <laughs> How would you describe him? Pugnacious. And his attitude to me? Oh, I couldn't say. And Polly? Well, indifferent. <sighs> He was a busy man. The best he was hoping for was a good marriage. And whom had I chosen? A French confidence trickster who had the temerity to die before my father had the chance to give him a piece of his mind. In short, my father felt deluded. The rock-solid assumptions upon which he built his world shook somewhat. He found he could not forgive me. So he threw you out? Yes, that's what Daddy did. And... I came to Europe and discovered I had a talent for bringing out the protector in men. You look shocked, Polly. Do I? Well, I'm sorry, I... I had to live. And before me lay what? Ruin. And not only financial, you understand, Polly. Yes. So you see... Francis Morton, when he came... Was a saviour, yes. <laughs> and the bonus? I fell in love with him. And now... And now he, he's killed for me. 
And, and I am to betray him? I can't. I'll join him in the dock. No. Why mustn't I? Because you don't deserve it. And who would ever believe that? Elizabeth, please don't go. Goodbye. How is the marmalade? Elizabeth? I didn't sleep last night. Of course not. Did you? I feel elated. It's still a shock to you, but you'll see it's for the best. I, I don't know. We can start again. Can we? Haven't you suffered enough? You're a very good man. Do you want to leave Brighton? Yes. I don't know. Well, if you want to, we can. We're free. What? How did I get lucky and meet you? We'll move to London, Belgravia. Isn't it expensive there? Yes. Listen, I'm going up to town today. I'll call in at some of the house agents, yes? All right. And we don't owe anything to Skinner anymore. That's all paid. You've been very generous to me. Oh. Aren't you worth it? Oh, trust me. The post. Francis. Get it. I didn't know where you were. Well, I've been journeying. Where did you stay last night? An old friend put me up. Someone you contacted from London? No, no. I walked in. You're being secretive. No, not at all. Someone I hadn't seen for years. How did you fare, Polly? I stayed in a bed and breakfast. Ah, pleasant landlady? Not really. Small, with a dog. And a good breakfast? Where were you? I perused the cakes. What? On the way in. The ABC Brighton stands up quite well to its sister house in the Strand. You're hungry. My friend and I talked through most of the night. He didn't offer food. And now you plan merely to have a cake? I was taken with the bread pudding, as a matter of fact. For once, someone's been generous with the cinnamon. A slab of that, Polly, and I'll be most satisfied. <laughs> and tea as well? And then you'll tell me what you've been doing. Everything, I promise. Ladies and gentlemen, this evening the great Supremo will attempt an illusion never before seen in a British theatre. You will appreciate that the line between illusion and reality is up to narrow. You'll find that if you push against that line at a certain point, the line becomes a door, and the door opens. For this experiment, ladies and gentlemen, I require the assistance of a member of the audience. <coughs> I think you might be disappointed with the cinnamon. <coughs> oh, no. No, very nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, go on. The Great Supremo. One of a selection of names he works under styles himself an illusionist. And what's that? A magician with pretensions. <laughs> Standing next to him, you'll discover eggs in your inside pocket and a washing line of coloured scarves protruding from your cuffs, you know, that sort of thing. How jolly. You don't like it. He's a very charming man. We met on a case that my notebooks have recorded as the Sloan Street Slaying. I don't remember that one. No, no, before your time. Ah. I might well have solved it a lot quicker with you. The great Supremo never had your role. He was your assistant? Uh, yes, an informal arrangement, naturally. But, I um, see. As I say, he was without your particular talent. Oh, you needn't. Uh, but what he lacked in insight, he made up for in trickery. Sometimes illusion can be rather useful, as I think we will prove in this case. You've been working on it? My meeting with him was fortuitous, but I stayed with him not merely out of nostalgia. For me, as you know, Polly, the past is either useful or it's an encumbrance. And in this case? Well, let me begin with the appointment I made to meet Francis Morton. You made? A note arrived in your absence. Why didn't you tell me? I wanted you to see Elizabeth without me. She's been in? Yes. I need to tell yes, you... Yes, of course, of course. But may I? I was walking. I wanted to think, Polly, about what you'd said. I'm sorry, I... I found myself by the pier. And in winter, as you know, a seaside pier is not brimming with customers. I became aware of a man watching me. 
He made no attempt to conceal himself. What did he look like? I can't be sure. He stood under a swinging lamp in a doorway. Tall, dark. You felt threatened? Certainly. But my instinct told me that whatever he wanted to do, he would not do here. So I moved off along the road. The sea quite close on the rocks to one side. He followed. At first keeping a distance, but gradually, very gradually, he began to close. Everything was shut, no shops, and the few lit houses I could see were away across the green. And then, in the middle of the wind and the dark, like a lit beacon, I saw the theatre, and in garish bulbs, on the cracked marquee, a name I recognised. The Great Supremo. Ladies and gentlemen, what are we? Our bodies, we are told, are but a collection of atoms and molecules which pursue fixed orbits too small for the eye to follow. You see before you a plain box. It is, in fact, the result of many years of scientific research. My own molecular accelerator. Now, for this experiment, I will need the cooperation of a member of the audience. Sir! You want a volunteer? Is that what you want? You should have seen his expression when I stepped onto the stage and he recognized me. <laughs> what about the man who was following you? Well, he'd taken a seat near me, but when I entered the box, what could he do? How did the accelerator work? I mean, I know it's a trick, but... I disappeared, Polly, from my pursuer. Magic! Who do you think he was? Ah, of that I'm not certain. I'm afraid we are too late, by the way. Armand is dead. Who told you this? Elizabeth. Yes. I advised her to go to the police, but she wouldn't hear of it. She was distraught. And is she coming back here? In fact, in fact, yes, any minute. I told her to bring Francis with her. And you haven't been to the police? I wanted to speak to you first. What would you tell them? i tell them that a man has been murdered. And Elizabeth? She had no part in it. I tell them that. Yes, yes, that's what you'd say. Where are you going? <clears throat> I want to make an entrance, Polly. Don't tell them you've seen me, but observe their expression when I come in. But why? We're nearly at the end. Our excursion is nearly over. I can't believe it. What is it? It's from Skinner. He... He wants money. He says he wants money, Elizabeth, to keep quiet. You, you, now listen you to said me. we'd be free. You no, said, wait, wait, that's listen. What, that's what you said to me. How did I know Skinner himself was going well, to turn on us? Well, now we're nowhere. We've got... We've listen. Got, you said... Look, I am the one who's taken risk. I've done this for you, Elizabeth. I am the one. What are we going to do? Had I imagined that we would replace one black mailer with another? You're surprised, I are am you? surprised. Well, I am. And the sum he wants? Twenty thousand pounds. Twenty thousand. Francis. Look, he's implicated in this. What? He's killed somebody. I mean, so therefore he won't take the you risk. You think we should refuse to pay? What? No, 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 no. He says, uh, well, listen. I will make sure the police know about your involvement in the death of Armand. What we're doing here, we have to keep each other afloat. What does that mean, Francis? It means we pay him. He will go. You, you don't think he'll come I, back? He took his chance to gather some escape money. He won't risk this blowing up any further. You think? One payment. Then I must make it clear. It's all right. I don't have £20,000. No? No. I'm very sorry. What do you mean? I've used the money I had. You thought... Yes. When you leave Chicago under a cloud, you leave without inheritance. Is that a tremendous shock to you? What? Do I look shocked? Yes. It's okay. I'll find it. I'll go up to town. What can I say to you? Nothing. I mentioned a friend, Polly Burton. Oh, yes. She's expecting us. And some companion of hers. That's right. Since I told her... Yes. And then afterwards we'll leave. That's right. You'll meet me in London. Yes. What? I have a feeling I can raise most of the money that Skinner's asking, but... What? If there is a shortfall... Of course. That's all I have. Twenty pounds. Twenty pounds? <laughs> then that's all you have. Polly. Oh, Elizabeth. <laughs> uh, Polly? Polly, this is Francis. Oh, how do you do? I'm pleased to meet you. Uh, well. Your friend isn't here? 
No. Francis has to go to London. Oh, when are you expecting him? Well, to tell you the truth... Has he... What is it, Polly? Hasn't he been back? No. When did you last see him? Yesterday, as a matter of fact. Ah. I'm afraid I couldn't meet him yesterday. He said... I'm sorry, perhaps today. If he comes... Oh, he's coming. He must be worried, Polly. No, no, he's coming now. Ah, am I late? Uh, this is Mr Morton. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? <laughs> and uh, Elizabeth, you know already. Yes. Ah. Does anybody want some tea? It proved nothing. Did you see her face? Polly? Yes. You did? You did, didn't you? I said yes. And? Nothing. Quite correct. And his? Oh, he was perhaps a little reserved. Exactly. What? A little reserved, that's all. Yes? Well, don't you see? No. I had no doubt he was amazed to see me alive. What? You think... Francis. Oh, but the story is much more complicated than that. Why should Francis want to harm you? Not him personally. The man he hired. Skinner? Now, wait, Polly. For an illusion to work, we must mistake it for reality. Reality is the oxygen that deception breathes. And so what happens when two illusions meet? You're saying that... that both of them... Listen... A young woman is ejected from the family home by her wealthy father. She was broken-hearted and then thrown out. She thought her husband had died. Why did she come to England? She drifted here. Can't you understand that? All right. Now, let's pinpoint the deception. He didn't die. Well, that's right, he didn't. He showed up asking for money. Now, wait. Let us say the story of her first husband, Amon's death, was fabrication. By whom? By both Amon and herself. What would be the point of it? The first, because she is an illusionist by nature. No, I don't All accept. All right, then. Say she and Amon were working together for money. How? They realise they have one piece of capital, his apparent death. It appeals to her, to, to her imagination. They both travel to England in search of a wealthy man. Francis? She marries him. You mean she marries Francis knowing Armand is still alive? Oh, that's not the worst of it. A little touch of bigamy in the night, please, Polly. The plan is that Armand will reappear demanding money. They estimate that her new husband, Francis, will pay up. But he doesn't. Francis tells Elizabeth that he is hiring a man to get rid of Armand forever. Incidentally, why? Why what? Why doesn't he pay? He's rich, isn't he? Why doesn't he pay? This is the point at which one illusion meets another. You're saying Elizabeth went along with it? The idea of killing Armand? I'm saying that Elizabeth suggested it. But that would be monstrous. Why would she? She sees an advantage in it. After all, she reasons she now has access to all the wealth of her new husband, Francis. What need has she any longer of Armand? So she doesn't warn him? On the contrary, she wanted it to happen, planned for it. And when Francis describes being shown the burning corpse, she feels her future opening up nicely. I'm sorry, I still find this atrocious, unacceptable. Your imagination is appalling. And all I'm doing is pushing the line between illusion and reality until the line becomes a door and the door opens. Two illusionists meet. What happens? But this is life. It's not an act. For some, life, as you so confidently call it, is just the starting point. I don't understand. Now, hear me out, Polly. In seeking out and marrying Francis Morton, Elizabeth's instincts had let her down. She, the great illusionist, did not recognise an illusion when she encountered it. For Francis Morton has no money. What? He is no more a banker than she is. He married her for the same reason she married him, for money, which on neither side exists. Then who was following you that night? Well, that was Skinner, yes. Francis had given him an extra job. 
He must have felt I was a pair of eyes he wanted off the scene. And the letter from Skinner demanding money? Forged by Francis. So at that point, he still believed she had money? Yes. It must have been a dreadful shock for him. And why... Why did she contact me? Why did she bother to... to call on my friendship? What do you think, Polly? She... Uh, she... <clears throat> she wanted... She knew your nature, Polly, that you're both loyal and law-abiding. Oh, please. Filed you away somewhere in the dark little box of her mind under to be used later. She knew you would go to the police. No. Overwhelming evidence that would free her and that would convict Francis. I'm sorry, Polly. Incidentally, I doubt that Armand is dead. What? No, no. Why would Francis have wasted the money on a real killer when all he needed was someone to act the part? So he cast Skinner, who is an actor of sorts. The great Supremo recognised him when he came into the theatre. Illusion folded on illusion, like the billowing black curtains that hang at the side of a stage. Some people feed on the reality of others. And that's the truth. Will they come back here? They will have agreed to meet somewhere, both knowing that they will never see each other again. Is that it? Armand de Tromouy is still out there and will look for her, and I doubt if she'll be pleased to see him when he finds her. Is that the last of the illusions? Yes. Never doubt, Polly, that your goodness is real. Shall I, um, get you a cup of tea, or...? No. Let's go for a walk along the beach, shall we? And then back to London. For, ladies and gentlemen, what is truth but a pathless land through which we wander, creatures of paradox, lost children, looking for home. In The Brighton Mystery by Michael Butt, based on a story by Baroness Auxey, Bernard Hepton was the man in the corner, and Suzanne Burden was Polly. Francis was played by Danny Webb, Elizabeth by Barbara Barnes, and Skinner by Christian Rodska. Other parts were played by members of the cast. The Tea House Detective, directed by John Taylor, 